All of our productions at GCTV are sponsored in part by Bay State Health, providing the care you and your family need when you need it close to home. Visit them online at baystatehealth.org. Greenfield Savings Bank. Visit them at 400 Main Street in Greenfield. Call them at 774-3191 or go online to greenfieldsavings.com. Greenfield Community College, providing access and excellence in higher education in the Pioneer Valley. Visit them at gcc.mass.edu. The Hammond Family. The Hammond Family are longtime supporters of Greenfield Community Television. New Fortune Chinese Restaurant on the Mohawk Trail in Greenfield. Visit them online at newfortuneMA.com. Call them at 772-0838 and check them out on Facebook. Real Cleaning Services. Cleaning Hampshire and Franklin County since 1972. We don't cut corners, we clean them. Check them out online at realclean.com. Call them at 413-422-1143. People's United Bank, located at 45 Federal Street in Greenfield. You can call them at 774-3713 or visit them online at peoples.com. The Solar Store of Greenfield, replacing fossil fuels and nuclear power one home at a time. Visit them at 23 Fisk Ave. Call them at 413-772-3122 or visit them online at solarstoreofgreenfield.com. Thank you to our sponsors for supporting all of GCTV's productions. Welcome. This is a meeting of the Greenfield School Committee. We are here at the Greenfield High School at 21 Bar Avenue. It is Wednesday, May 9th at 5.30 p.m. And um, could we have a roll call, please? Committee Member Ekstrom. Here. Committee Member Hollins. Here. Committee Member Karen. Here. Committee Member Ward, I show is absent. Mayor Martin, I show is absent. I have myself and Committee Member Nunez. Here. Chairperson, we do have a quorum. Thank you, Secretary Alexander. Um, so we do have some executive session business to attend to immediately. We will um, be in executive session for approximately one hour and then return to our regular meeting at that time. Um, can we have a motion to enter into executive session for uh, reason number two, to conduct strategy sessions in preparation for negotiations with non-union personnel? These are for multiple administrator contracts. Is there a second? Second from Member Ekstrom, moved by Member Hollins. Um, roll call, please. Committee Member Ekstrom. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Committee Member Hollins. Yes. Committee Member Karen. Yes. Committee Member Nunez. Yes. And I vote yes. We are in executive session at 533. Thank you. Thank you to everyone who has been waiting. We, or I, certainly did miscalculate how long our executive session would take. So thank you very much for your patience. Um, the first item on our agenda is the approval of draft minutes from 4-11-18. Um, there is one error in the minutes at the top with the date. I believe it's listed as May 11th. Um, so <clears throat> we would like a correction there to reflect April 11th, 2018. Um, are there any, is there a motion to approve draft minutes from 4-11-18? So moved. Is there a second? Okay, any further discussion beyond the correction of the date? Has everyone had a chance to review? Okay. <laughs> Would you all like more time to review? Or? Okay. 
would we well we have a motion on the table um, any questions or deliberation okay um, all those in favor of approving the April 11 2018 minutes okay seeing four eyes um, anyone against you're a yes okay so minutes pass I believe member Hollins you say yes okay so that is unanimous we will move on to public comment are there any members of the public that are here to speak please come forward to the microphone here hi Doug welcome um, pardon <laughs> Well, you know, we've been thinking for two hours. Uh -huh. um, so just as a reminder, uh, public comment, you receive three minutes to speak. And um, for those who are not familiar, there is a little button that says push. When you come to the microphone, you'll, you're going to want to push that button. Please state your name and uh, your address, please, for the record. Doug Selwyn, 38 Forest Avenue in Greenfield. Thank you. So I'm here to talk about the, um, the SRO, which I understand you are, is on your agenda tonight. Um, and I want to strongly urge that the money that is being proposed to hire the uh, school resource officers be used instead to um, be applied to services that support the kids, counselors, teachers, more resources, more professional development. Um, I'm advocating this for a number of reasons. We all want safe schools, um, but the research shows that having additional officers in schools don't make the schools safer. What does make the schools safer um, are a number of programs and personnel that, um, that go directly to supporting the kids. So I have um, some paper because I know you need more to read. Um, this from the, the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, talking about preventing school violence and what they uh, advocate is not more um, SROs, but more programs that strengthen young people's abilities to effectively solve difficulties that arise, pro-social activities, school-based programs in violence prevention, programs that help kids um, get together with teachers and families to figure out how to be with each other most usefully. Um, there are community level strategies that involve more parent involvement, more community involvement, not through um, police, but through more social and pro-social activities. Um, the, there's a the sentencing project, facts about dangers of added police in schools, um, talk about um, research that shows that actually having more police in schools makes the schools more dangerous, um, raises the level of violence. And I'll bring these up to you so you have them to take a look at. So it's counterproductive. It's a sort of a knee jerk to there's something, some violence that happened, let's bring in more police. And, and um, overall, it doesn't show to be a valid thing to do. Um, a well-intentioned perhaps, but not valid. The other thing I want to link to this is that there's quite a bit of research to show that public education is a worthy investment for state government, for local governments. It's good business to invest in the schools. People move to, to places because their schools are good. Um, high school dropouts are more than twice as likely to be unemployed and three times more likely to receive welfare assistance. Decreasing the number of high school dropouts by half would nationally produce $45 billion a year in net economic benefit to society. There are more statistics I won't bore you with, but I'll give you the paper that suggests that investing in the schools makes sense. So for the third year in a row, cutting the school budget makes no sense. What we're doing is putting the schools in a deeper hole. And so spending $200,000 on police officers where that money could be spent to support the schools in other ways makes good sense. The $100,000 that was misallocated, I guess, if that goes also into the schools, that would be $300,000 more to support the schools, and that makes good sense to me. 
Um, students were, were... You're at three minutes. Sorry, my timer is really low. But I had the but really good stuff real just quick. coming. <laughs> okay, thank you. <laughs> thank you so much. Thank you. So, um, push? Push. <laughs> push. Am yes, the light okay. illuminated. Uh, the green light is on. Great. Um, my name is Jan Mayer. I live at 38 Forest Avenue in Greenfield. Um, I'm a retired educator. And uh, I think what Doug was about to say is that the students who spoke at the city council meeting uh, expressed strongly the feeling that they would not feel safer with more, uh, that, that they did not feel physically unsafe right now, that they feel emotionally unsafe. And that speaks to all of the things that Doug just mentioned. I too have some things for you, <laughs> some reading. It's what we teachers do. Um, but I want to just echo everything he said, but add to it something that I uh, I found really, I don't know, concerning about, um, as I did a little research in this, I looked into uh, the basic uh, certification for an SRO in Massachusetts, and it calls for 40 hours of instruction covering 15 topics that include school law, understanding the teen brain, effects of youth trends and drugs on schools, threat response, understanding special needs students, diversity, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. 40 hours to cover all of that material. A counselor or a teacher probably has a class in almost every one of those topics and so is doing vastly more uh, learning about uh, how to really serve the needs of students. So um, again, I, you know, I understand that everybody's sort of nervous these days about safety but the research, as, as has already been said, is very clear on this, that what really makes safer schools is attention to building community, is attention to um, having more counselors, having more people in roles that, um, that the students feel safe with. And some students may very well feel safe with more um, SROs in the school, but a, a very significant number, and the ones most likely to be um, um, in, in trouble one way or another, whether it's because they, don't, they are not fluent speakers of English yet or they have other things going on in their home life that makes it difficult to function well. They are the ones who feel least settled by this and who need most of our support. So I would urge you all to do everything you can to to um, promote the idea that what the schools really need is more counselors, more teachers, more people who can directly serve the needs of the students. And that's what's going to make our schools safer. Um, thank you very much. Hi. Thank you. Look. There we go. There you go. Hi. My name is Paul DeMarco. I work for the Massachusetts Teachers Association. I represent the Greenfield Education Association and, and teachers and uh, staff and other districts in the area. And I've handed you out two pages from the budget book, which are collated. So if you just take one pointing one way and one pointing the other way, you'll get both pages. It's pages 25 and 44 from the budget book. And I'll wait till you have them. There were two facing one way, two facing the other way. Great. Susan knows I have problems with handouts. 
There were actually four different angles, but it's all good. Okay. We now each have page 44 and 25, right? Do you have 44? Perfect. Great. So I presented this a little while ago to the Ways and Means Committee, and they were receptive, I think. Um, what I'd like to point out is on page 25, uh, if you look at other amounts to be raised, you'll see there's one called Snow and Ice Deficit. It's the third one down. There was no funding in previous years for this account. Um, it's $300,000. Um, if the city were to create a, a, a rainy day or a snowy day fund, um, it already actually has. It's called the general fund, and that's what you use um, when you have more snow or ice to remove than you would think. But if you want to create a separate fund, um, the Department of Revenue recommends that generally reserve should be about 12% of the annual budget. So um, on page 44, if you look down, let's see which I didn't miss. It's under public works, um, snow and ice removal. The total cost for snow and ice removal is $225,000 in next year's budget. So basically this line item, snow and ice deficit, is creating, um, I don't know, we're expecting the ice age or something. It's creating more than double the amount of uh, funding that you would need in any given year to remove to remove the snow and ice. So um, we think it's entirely unnecessary. This is a source of funding that could be used to fund the school's budget. Um, I know there are a number of um, city councilors who would support this, but it'd be very helpful if the school committee would also be um, bringing this to the town council's attention um, because they're not gonna do anything if you don't support it. So I wanted to make sure that you were aware of this. Um, also, if you look at the police department budget or the uh, public works budget, uh, the mayor gave them both 10% uh, increases to their budgets, but um, that was more than they asked for themselves, whereas the schools, the mayor cut your budget by 4.5% or approximately. Um, you have inc increasing enrollment for the past two years, and the city's per capita pupil spending has gone down almost by $1,000 over the past two years. So you're really abandoning your kids. Um, and it's a shame, and I think your kids deserve better than that. I'd also like to um, endorse the comments by Doug and Jan about this SRO. Um, you could put that money back into the budget as well, $114,000. It won't get you to your, to your total um, budget or the cuts that the mayor has been doing, but it's a good start. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Are there any other members of the public that would like to speak? Okay, seeing none, we will move on to reports, starting with our student representative. Thanks for waiting it out for us. We appreciate you. I brought homework just in case. <laughs> <laughs> I've been out there eating Skittles and doing homework, so it's okay. So it's the first full week of May, which as at DHS, we know it as AP testing. So kids have been dreading or looking forward to this week. It's, very, it's shifted the tone at DHS to a lot more academics and rigorous studying, last minute procrastination the usual high, high school tendencies. And then the week after is, not next week, the week after that is MCAS testing, where the freshmen and sophomores will be taking their MCAS. I believe this one's math. And then after that, the sophomores will never have to take MCAS again, given that they pass. And this Friday night at 7 p.m., the Moose Lodge is holding a fundraiser for GHS Student Council. It's a trivia night where it's ten dollars to go and nine of those dollars will go directly to help supporting kids from student council going to a leadership camp for like four or five days this summer pretty good cause i suggest that you all go i know it's always been a blast from everyone i've heard it from it's 21 and up so there will be no students there oh. and if that's not your alley the film festival is this friday doors open at 5 15 it starts at six it's a great way to see what the youth of the community have been working on in terms of films. I know it goes from elementary to high school, so you see a wide variety of different viewpoints, like 
satire, comedy, tragedies, love stories, even the occasional music video. It, it all just kind of mixes in. And coming up next month is the Relay for Life, which from GHS we have the National Honor Society representing and the cross country team will always have at least two people running around the track for the entire duration of the event to show that it's a like enduring and long struggle but we're the, willing to show our support for the entirety of the event. And an exciting thing for seniors is prom is May 19th. That is next Saturday. It's at the log cabin. A lot of people have been going to get their suits and dresses and hems and just finally finishing things up for their for the cream of their senior year just the moment they've all been waiting for just that last hurrah before they finally graduate on June 1st on Friday May 25th we will be doing our two hours of community service where we go where during team where we go and help the community in a like plethora of ways except this time instead of going by team or advisory students will be able to choose which one they want to go to which will like have higher quality participation and also what's better than like helping your community while also hanging out with your friends at the same time uh, the band went on to the overnight trip to boston and the flutes came back with a gold medal from mica which is pretty rare and got them invited back to perform at a gold medal showcase where all of the people who have gotten gold medals go and perform so people can go and see a high quality performance which is pretty nice knowing that our flutes are high quality and gold medal length which is pretty great and now to talk about myself because you know I love to I had the international <laughs> moose competition as you heard and I ranked fifth in the nation, winning a $2,000 scholarship during that, which was... I'd bow, but I'm sitting, so... <laughs> so, it was a really amazing time. I've made friends that I still keep in contact with. The group chats still keep me up at night when I should be studying. It's pretty amazing. And then, I no, I may not have won... But since I didn't come top three, I can return next year to try and win the grand prize. And I, but I will say I won the Halloween costume contest that was after the voting as Taylor Swift. And did a performance the little country made me do that Miss Pat No gave two big thumbs up to. That has been your monthly report. Thank you very much. Any questions for our student representative? No, I do not, because I've been too focused on my academics, but it's something I've done in the past and would really have, like, I like to do the film stuff, but I haven't really had a, an elective since eighth grade and won't in high school because of APs <laughs> and academics. Well, thank you very much and congratulations on your scholarship award. Thanks a lot. Thank you, Susan. I look forward to that. I hope you liked my solo and then also the solo that we never practiced. Okay, thank you very much. So we'll move on to um, chairperson and superintendent report. Um, I have just a couple of things. I want to start with a, just an expression of appreciation again for those that are in the audience that have been waiting for us. We tried a new um, process today in having our executive session in advance, and I appreciate the willingness of committee members to come in early and also our minutes, um, our secretary, Susan Farber. So thank you, everyone, 
um, for that. And also, um, just to take a moment to express appreciation for all of our teachers, I believe it is Teacher Appreciation Week, so we appreciate each and every one of you. Thank you very much, and everyone who helps to support all of our students here at the Greenfield Public Schools. Um, aside from that, I just have two quick updates for the committee. The first is um, a, a, a suggestion to change the charter of the city of Greenfield from Councillor Vern's son. This was forwarded to me, um, and I believe that it's of interest to school committee members. This isn't an official item as as an agenda item, we don't necessarily have to take a stance on it, but I wanted everyone to know that this is something that's in deliberation right now, and it is regarding um, modifying uh, term limits placed um, on counselors, the mayor, as well as school committee members. So that's in your packet. Um, I do not know the date at which that will be voted on. Right now it's in subcommittee. And then I also wanted to follow up with everyone on the school committee shared folder um, that we had talked about at our last meeting, and I'm still working on that. Um, I think it will be a relatively simple thing that can be resolved actually tomorrow in a meeting. Um, and I will report back to you all on that progress. Um, and then uh, one other item is that we do anticipate a vote on school choice coming up very soon. It was on the calendar for this month, um, but through conversation with the superintendent, uh, I made the decision to delay slightly. So we may have a special meeting coming up and, and vote on it then, or it will be at the on the June agenda. And then in terms of information from the superintendent, we have <clears throat> our usual packet um, telling us about what's going on in our schools. Um, and I did want to make a quick announcement regarding our food service director has um, uh, put in her resignation in order to spend more time with her family and um, just wanted to let everyone know that that is now a job that is available. So if anyone out there is interested, please um, inquire with the superintendent's office um, as well uh, just a moment to say thanks to Madison for her work here in Greenfield. Um, in your packet is also our regular budget reports. We are not necessarily going through them this evening, but if there are questions, we can entertain some questions. Um, as well, there is announcement of the graduation ceremony and class night that is upcoming. I do encourage committee members to attend. It's really great to go and see, just bear witness to our graduates. It's wonderful. Um, so that concludes myself, my report, and also an abbreviated report from the superintendent. Are there any questions regarding any of the materials that I just breezed through, or any questions for the business office who is here Okay, I'm seeing none. Um, and so we can move on to our school, or I'm sorry, our subcommittee reports. Um, and I just ask that with the subcommittee reports, if there's anything that's, that's would be more appropriate for an in-depth conversation on the agenda item, for example, the school resource officer, please consider holding the uh, report of the subcommittee until that agenda item. Um, but otherwise, we've all been provided our minutes, and I will yield the floor to Member Alexander if you want to report out on personnel and negotiations and policy. Thank you. Uh, the Personnel and Negotiation Subcommittee met on the 17th of April, 2018. Our discussion topics were continuing discussion on the Human Resources Memorandum of Instruction, which has been in a uh, quite lengthy discussion for several months now. And we also began uh, discussions about our legal representation in which we're coming up later this summer in month of June to uh, renew our contracts. Um, 
upcoming topics for discussion that we're going to be picking up uh, on May 22nd is to uh, pick up a previously tabled discussion on legislative representation and work up a <coughs> rough draft of a duties descriptions as well as a formal recommendation to present to full committee. Um, I was also asked as a reminder to remind us here on the committee that uh, superintendent with her annual evaluation is coming up next month. She will be having her self-assessment and supporting documentations available on the 18th of May from the roughly that date all the way through the 3rd of June. Each committee member will have that packet and they'll be able to make their own individual assessment comments. And then on the 4th of June, committee member Ekstrom will be collecting all of the individual comments and collating it into one formal evaluation to be presented to the superintendent. And one thing I would like to also remind us is during that uh, time period while committee member Ekstrom is doing the collating, just kind of keep your eye on the email or your phone because she may need you to clarify something, okay? Uh, we really want this process to go, go through smoothly and with uh, minimal bumps in the road so we can do a really good job. And then of course right now we are tentatively scheduled for the 18th of June a special meeting to conduct the evaluation of the superintendent. Um, the only recommendation that we're presenting from the personnel subcommittee is <clears throat> in reference to the human resources memorandum of instruction. Um, I'll just read it verbatim here. Personnel Subcommittee recommends the Town of Greenfield consider and evaluate cost-saving options for human resources services, including an online program to provide employees a self-service option for benefits administration for, for future possible expansion to school district employees. So basically what we're asking for the city to create, if they don't have it already or put it together, is some kind of an online or uh, self-service option so that uh, school district employees can uh, better monitor and track their benefits. And so we uh, submit that as a recommendation for a possibility to be forwarded to the uh, mayor. And that is all for I have for this. Um, for both policy and personnel and negotiations or just uh, you need to go on to policy? Sure, yeah, go on into policy. All righty. So, segueing right on into the policy subcommittee. Uh, policy subcommittee, we met on the 24th of April, where we continued uh, discussions that we've had over the past couple of months on the Policy 21 initiative. And later on tonight, I will be able to present you a recommendation because it is on the agenda. Uh, this past meeting, we also, as a subcommittee, took a critical look at policies BG. BGB, BGC, all of these policies are relating to policy adoption and review. This was not an official review, it was just basically for the subcommittee to read through it and understand it a little better and start thinking about any possible changes or corrections that we may need to do in the near future. Upcoming policy, uh, hang on a second, I got my notes backwards here, sorry. Also during this meeting, we also had a discussion and it's not an official policy right now, but we are working on language on um, students being returned to school after school hours. This has been referred to us from the health and safety subcommittee. And right now it's being, uh, in, more information is being gathered by the superintendent so that we can finish creating this policy. And upcoming policy uh, events that we have coming up, we'll be looking at policy BDE, that is the subcommittees of the school committee, and that is coming up on May 29th. And again, I'll have my recommendation for when we get to it in the, during the agenda. Thank you, Member Alexander. Um, are there any questions for Member Alexander? Okay, seeing none, we'll move on to the next report. Um, Member Hollins? Thank you. Uh, member Hollins is going to report out on the budget subcommittee because um, Member Ward and Mayor Martin are not here. Yes, the budget subcommittee met on May 2nd. 
Um, as you might imagine, the discussion primarily centered on the difference between the budget that the school committee voted and the budget for FY19 that the mayor recommended in his comprehensive city uh, budget. And there is a difference of $800,000. So most of our discussion was, how do we bridge those two numbers? As you may recall, we had voted on a special report from our business uh, services contractor for revolving funds so we could better separate the funds by year. Um, and we talked about that. We had a discussion on the superintendent, the um, mayor, uh, recommending that $150,000 be placed in a city stabilization fund for special education. He said there's already 100000 in the city's special ed stabilization account, and with the passage of this budget, another 150 will go in, giving the city a $250,000 stabilization account. Uh, we went through all of our revolving funds against what we voted as a safe amount to carry forward for stabilization purposes. You remember we spent a long time discussing that policy. And after going through all of these, we actually took a motion, a vote, um, just so it would be clear what we were thinking. And the motion was, a, and it was based on a report from the superintendent to accept the superintendent's recommendation for reserve fund for use in the FY19 budget as in the April 24, 2018 report uh, for a total of $426,069.04. And the discussion about this vote, uh, the mayor made the motion, I seconded it, there's only three of us, Cam is the third as chair. The discussion that the mayor made was that uh, the vote bringing to you that we use 426,000 supports the presentation we had at our meeting. It's compatible with our new revolving funds policy. It cleans up two old pothole accounts and it will greatly help with the difference in the FY19 budget. Um, we did note that there's still we still have encumbered bills to pay and the exact balances of these accounts may be different than in the report because that so we noted that those numbers may change a little bit. And we also took another vote to ask the superintendent to come back with some more information on a, a couple of funds, particularly special intuition accounts. Um, and so at our next meeting, we'll have some more information. It was a long meeting, but I think anyone who attended the meeting understands our policy on revolving funds, all the different revolving funds we have. Um, and that was useful. The second thing we talked about at the end of the meeting was really enrollment. If you'll recall, the superintendent in presenting a budget recommendation um, anticipated 100 new students. So we talked about that because that rec that estimate was made in January and our meeting was in May. So even though it's still an estimate because you open your doors, we had a little bit better information. And that estimate is now changed to um, the new estimate is 40 students. And it and that led to a discussion of the middle school, if you'll recall, or you may not recall, one of our budget meetings when we were talking about um, new positions needed, needed or requested, there's a request for a fifth grade position in the middle school. And the reason for that, I don't remember exactly, but something like we have nine fourth grades going to grade five, and we only have eight grade five teachers. That Those may not be the right number of grades, but it was something like that. And it looks like, based on the estimate now, that that really is a 
actual number of students moving up. Gary said that they're not seeing very much movement of people moving away, which is great. Um, and so I had said at the meeting, there may be some things that were taken out of our budget when we were creating it that we actually need to look at as long as we're going over the whole budget again with the fight tooth comb. So we had a very long informative meeting about person um, enrollment and funds. And we think we have made some dent in uh, looking at the difference between what the mayor recommended and what we thought we needed when we voted our budget. Are there any questions for Member Hollins? Did you raise your hand, Member Ekstrom? Did you raise your hand? Okay. Um, thank you, Member Hollins. Health and safety. So we too had a nice, long, and very productive meeting. Um, almost everything we talked about is on our agenda for this evening. We discussed in length the SRO proposal as we saw it and reminded ourselves as well as everyone in attendance that we are not discussing a person, we're discussing a role. So just to be clear while we're going over all of these things. Um, and we also talked about a couple of issues Again, that will be on the uh, agenda later about possible need help with some crosswalk painting and stuff like that. Um, it was a really long and very thought out conversation and didn't necessarily end with a clear cut decision or any of that. But like I said, we can, I think we should probably just get into it later and I'm sure there are a lot of thoughts. So unless there's questions. Okay, are there any questions for Member Karen at this moment? Okay, seeing none, we have um, two school committee representatives. That's Member Hollins um, for the Planning and Construction Committee. Did you all meet? Isn't that what it's called? Yeah. Okay, great. <laughs> um, I don't. If we met, I don't recall being at the meeting, but I've been at every meeting so far. Um, the, the big issue at the last meeting is the role of this committee and how the recommendations of this committee are picked up and used in city planning, similar to the discussion we're having about the role of the school committee, uh, particularly regarding capital um, reviewing capital requests. Thank you. And Member Ekstrom, um, our representative from the Collaborative of Educational Services, did you all meet prior to our last meeting? Okay, thank you. So I think that that closes out all of our reports. Um, and we will jump right into our first business item, which is the school resource officer proposal. Um, hi. I did send an invitation to Chief Haig to attend the meeting and he unfortunately had um, a, a prior commitment. So he has sent a statement with Deputy Chief Williams. Is that correct? Thank you very much for your patience <laughs> and um, thanks for coming. I think that the easiest thing to do is to start with hearing your statement um, and then we can follow up with any questions in our deliberation. And I just want to start with reminding the committee that um, there is not necessarily a need to make a decision this evening on anything. Um, the other thing, yes, yeah, so I just, I just want everyone to know that in advance before we begin. So please um, jump right in. Right. Good Thank evening, you. everybody. Uh, Chief Haig regrets that he can't be here, but he did prepare a statement and asked that I present it to the committee. Uh, I was instructed not to get too deep into questions uh, as I'm hesitant to speak too much on his behalf because he's been much more involved in this discussion with you than, than I have. So, But I will do my best if there's anything I feel like I can safely answer. But just I'm not trying to intentionally be evasive on anything, just following orders. So 
Uh, Chief Haig did prepare this statement, though. The Dear Committee, on February 26th, I took part in a conversation in the superintendent's office with several administrative staff, including the current school resource officer. During that meeting, I felt I heard a concern that other than at the high school, there was a lack of presence of the school resource officer and that the schools in the elementary levels would appreciate a more visible presence. Prior, prior to this meeting, I had already been speaking with the mayor about a thought of improving school officer presence by adding school resource officers to the school district. With so many schools within the Greenfield district and being spread out across town, one officer is simply not enough. An additional concern was guaranteed coverage on a daily basis, which with one school resource officer, it cannot be accomplished. To solve these concerns, I believe three school resource officers is the best solution. Three officers will allow for at least two school resource officers to be on duty on any given day. Additionally, this will allow for more flexible schedules, especially when all three are on, for activities that are outside of a normal school day schedule. I do not believe anyone realizes the impact an officer-student relationship can have in a positive manner, as I feel the police are being portrayed in a negative light simply because of money. At the time of the meeting on February 26, the budget was not configured or settled, and I felt my proposal was a welcome plan for safety, visibility, and community relations. Now that the budget numbers have been presented, I feel these two additional positions are about dollars and cents, not what is best for the City of Greenfield school system. I am not willing to change my proposal, as I feel I am recommending something that will benefit more than just protection for students, but will support staff and administration as well. I will not state my, that my desire for more school resource officers is any more or less important than any staffing or other need the school department feels they may need, as I am not a professional educator. However, I believe this is the best option for our school district to create a safer environment for staff and students, while also creating better relationships between the youth of our city and its police officers, which in fact has proven to be a benefit to general community relations, partnerships, and information sharing through trust and bonds. I apologize for not being present tonight, but do feel I have presented the best case possible to improve on the city's safety and school relationships as a whole. Sincerely, Chief Robert Haig. Thank you, Deputy Chief Williams. Um, are there any questions from school committee members immediately? Yes, Member Alexander. I guess my one question would be is, is uh, what criteria, what constraints did we come to the number of three officers um, based on the uh, uh, geographical locations of the building? And I guess my second question would be, uh, yeah, we'll, we'll stick with that one for the moment. Okay. Uh, again, not speaking for Chief Haig, but giving my own perspective on this, I, I wasn't part of those initial discussions when this was... Uh, developed but we have operationally of course discussed if this happens how are we going to implement this what kind of expectations will we have and that was one of the things we talked about okay what if we have three how do we deploy them uh, our our Im immediate thought of course this would obviously be in consultation with school leadership um, and the school committee obviously to help determine these things but uh, we figured three would allow for a more consistent presence if not an everyday presence at the middle school, which we feel uh, has a need and, and doesn't get all the attention that it can get just because of having only one officer now. And then having the third officer available to uh, visit elementary schools, private schools as they wish in the district, and, and also, you know, potentially have kind of a fill-in system where if one officer is out vacation, training, sick, whatever reason, you know, we can fill the gap uh, with that third person. So that, that's, that's, I believe, from my perspective, how the number three felt like it would be a good, a good operational number for us. Thank you. Did you have a follow-up question? Uh, I just want to clarify and make sure I'm understanding. Um, so basically, three officers, you'll have will you have any officer like permanently based in one location and the other two are floating to different schools each day or is this a, a patrol like x hours in one school then they move on to the next school uh, 
is it you know what's the uh, patrol look like I, I think that would all be need to be determined um, I just know that when we were discussing you know potentially some areas where we could add a school resource officer presence our our immediate thought was well the middle school is, is kind of the next logical place to to put somebody more consistently now whether it was every hour of every day that would remain to be seen uh, and then you know there's still a number of schools beyond the middle school in the district so we thought if the third person was working uh, other schools could could be visited that don't get you know nearly enough attention right now just because they can't anybody else member hollins yes thank you for coming to represent the chief I had um, three things that go through my mind, and as Member Karen said, we, we had a long meeting, discussion, very long meeting, long discussion. <laughs> but the three things that go through my mind are first, I, I really respect Chief Haig for doing what he thinks is right from his position. He came up with a recommendation of what he thinks from a police chief's point of view is right, and I really respect that he says to us, look, I'm not changing the recommendation I was requested to give for my position, so I'm fine with him not altering his recommendation. The second thing that goes through my mind are just questions about money, but not so much where it is in the budget, but more what the school district pays. You know, how many, like you mentioned, people go on leave, they have vacation, they get sick, you know, and our arrangement we're paying, as I understand, for a certain number of days. So I wonder about that. And the third is um, a reservation I have that I'm not sure anyone else has is um, new expectations we developed. My understanding is that we have a very close relationship with the police department and anytime anything happens in a school, we pick up the phone, we call the police and they're there really quickly. That's my experience. And I have a slight worry that if we get three officers in the school and something happens over here and we pick up the phone, we call the police department, there may, there may develop, I'm not saying it would, some idea within the police department, wait a minute, we got SROs for that and time go by instead of immediate response like we have now. And because we get that a little bit um, over the years, maybe this isn't a good example, in special education, where we have some people hired to work with special children, children with special needs, and some people that are hired to work with everybody, and then you get sometimes, you know, well, wait a minute, someone else is hired to do that. And I would never want anything, including, I would never want an unintended consequence of having three officers assigned to the schools that we call, and we have a need where someone might have zipped over where people start hunting for school resource office. That's something that goes through my mind if we get too dependent on school resource officers as opposed to just officers. That's all. Thank you for I being here. You're welcome. Um, Member Karen, did you want to um, expand a little bit on the conversation that was had at the health and safety meeting? Absolutely. Um, Susan brought up one of our many concerns um, that that could become a problem not you know not on purpose it sort of just happens so we're referring you to this person instead um, we also just didn't know if there'd been a needs assessment done like a true when we have to hire a new position the superintendent has to come to us with a needs assessment and she has to say this is why I need it these are the hours these are the places and one of our things that we did discuss and we clearly have a need is for a truancy officer. And so that was our, one of our massive concerns was that that's what we really need as a school district. We need someone to help us with this position. And we heard from other school administrators and I, I hear exactly what Chief was saying in that if he feels like this is an attack on the dollars and cents at this point. And I can hear that. And it does feel very, I can see how it feels like out came the budget where we got this massive cut and now we're all mad about it. I speak for myself and I hope that it, and other people can chime in. That is not my reason for not wanting or wanting this position. I'm trying to separate money from that. Unfortunately, the reality of anybody in the school system or town or anything right now, it's a lot about money. Um, 
what well, we had a long conversation and we couldn't come to a full consensus as a committee the only full consensus as a committee we could come to is that we didn't see that we needed three we saw that there was some support for one there was support for half one there was support for two we couldn't we couldn't get to a full consensus as a committee we could say that we needed positions for a behaviorist so that if we had a behaviorist at the elementary schools, then maybe that would alleviate um, the one SRO's job at that level. If we had a truancy officer, then that would help alleviate some of the load on that level as well. Um, I don't think that we had any specific questions at the time, as we really wished to have been a more fully thought out or more explanative proposal instead of just these are the two I want, this is what they might wear, done. We wanted what are they gonna do? Where are they gonna go? How is the training gonna be handled? If there's only one conference for the training every year, how are you gonna work that out with three new people? Um, anyone who was there can chime in or ask questions. Um, like I said, we just weren't sure. There was no, we just felt a little pushed into a decision. Um, there is legislation coming down. We haven't gotten it all the way yet. So there will be legislative changes to the MOU that might need to be made anyway. Um, that was discussed, but I don't know if Susan wants to chime in or Adrian. Member Hollins. I, I could say that um, the discussion wasn't only about police being police, kind of, in a police role. We also in the discussion was the need for someone who would feel safe going uh, to the home of a family or going up to a teenager uh, about being in school and that if if and when we had additional support an unmet need in the district is someone who can assist the schools with attendance issues because not many people in the school district feel comfortable these days going to a home or stopping a teenager on the street saying you know why aren't you in school so we had uh, a long part of our discussion was around the need of the school system for some assistance in attendance. What would that look like for attendance monitoring? Thank you, Member Hollins. Um, any questions or comments from other members? Okay. Um, I again, I just I do want to remind the committee that we don't necessarily need to make. A decision this evening on anything related to school resource officers um, however the council will be voting on the city budget very soon um, at the end of the month and um, I they may be looking to us for um, some guidance related to funding um, they may not um, also Obviously, all of our meeting minutes and everything are public documents, so we can be sure to forward them if that's of interest. Um, and then I just also want to remind each and every one of us that this is a program of the Greenfield Public Schools. It is governed by the school committee. So any changes to the school resource officer program is governed by us. So with or without funding for additional positions, we have the authority to make any changes to the current program. Member Karen. I, the one, I should, I should have mentioned this, the one unanimous decision that we all could come to was that if we would really hope that any of the extra money could be shifted back to us, that if we could make a recommendation to the council, it would be if you have extra money, please shift it back to us. Um, because if we had one SR, extra SRO that's still up for conversation, we could really use some support in other areas, like I said, a truancy officer, a behaviorist, things that could help alleviate the original role. So that was the only thing that we all could be unanimous about, which was, please, if you can, we could use that money in many ways. Member Hollins. Um, 
I recollect that we talked about the current memorandum of understanding that it would have to be changed, or did I just... It, the, so there is legislation coming down. So we were going to wait to see what that was. Right. We um, were hoping to get a law alert from MASC to make it extremely clear. Um, it seemed to us that there was some, in the new legislation, it just, just passed a couple weeks ago now, that there's some new legislation about the standard operating procedures, very specifically that that was how that would be handled, including evaluation process and all of that. Um, but we haven't gotten a real clear... So we were going to wait on that. So we were going to wait on that to be clear. And, and in addition, the memorandum we have is explicit about there being one officer and being based at the high school. Correct. So, so if anything happens, that whole thing needs to be... So I actually think we should make some decision tonight because it's the middle of May and the city council is going to vote their budget. And we... We would have, it seems to me, we would need to endorse uh, two more officers, one more officer, no more officer, but we should do something so the city council knows what we want, or do you want to wait till the end of the meeting in case there's some other discussion of budget? Um, I'm seeing that Member Alexander had his hand up and also Member Ekstrom, so Let's pause that thought and hear from Member Alexander first, if you don't mind, or unless you want to yield, sure, Member Ekstrom. I think, I think us trying to make a decision without a needs assessment, formal needs assessment, much like the superintendent brings to us about staffing and teaching teachers numbers through the school system, would be ill-advised at the very least. I mean, you know, I could say, hey, I think we need four, and okay awesome but I don't have any hard evidence to back up why we would need four or why we would need one so I think we would be ill-informed and ill-advised to do anything without more information about actual needs assessment I mean we know what we need and I and the chief is telling us what he believes would be appropriate what what is his assessment based on Thank you, Member Member Ekstrom. Member Alexander, did you have a comment? Uh, Chair, is it okay if I ask uh, Deputy Chief Williams one more quick question? Uh, when we're talking about plussing up the officer and the strength of who's on duty and stuff like that, um, what is the, uh, I'm trying not to use Army lingo, uh, but what is the overall mission that the Chief is aiming for? Is he aiming for a high level of violence or is he aiming for a high visible presence to dispel violence uh, basically I guess when I was in the military when you create an operations order and you make a plan you have a specific target in mind you're going to hit something or you're going to do something and when you resource personnel and I'm just trying to get an idea what does the chief what is he planning for is I guess what I want to know where he's going with this well, I, I believe in his statement he referenced, you know, the benefits he sees in the program and, and building relationships between us and the youth uh, and the schools. So uh, certainly I, I believe that his vision is that we can increase those partnerships, uh, increase those, those bonds. I think there's a belief on our part if we can reach youth earlier, uh, you know, uh, uh, maybe get some intervention in troubled families and troubled situations earlier by getting to know these kids younger before they're in high school. Uh, that can have an untold effect on prevention of future problems. So again, that's, this, that's Deputy Chief Williams speaking, not Chief Haig, but I, I can only uh, you know, assume that's, that's one of the benefits of, of involving officers in the schools in this way. And, and clearly the Commonwealth has, has made a pretty clear statement with the uh, latest reform that was just signed uh, of the, in, the intention of where they want school resource officers to go and, and the direction they want programs to go in. And I, I think we're largely there already here. I, I think that was, I think they, there's possibly other districts in the state that weren't operating like ours, but I, I think I think we've done a great job here, collectively, school committee and the police department, and in, in uh, you know doing what we have with our program. So that's 
that's as best I can answer your question. It, it, I really should leave Chief Haig to explain what his thinking is on that. Uh, we, we've really spoken more about, uh, like I said, operations type of, of ideas, not so much about you know, theoretical concepts of, you know, why, you know, what, what's our mission per se. I mean, we just kind of focused on if we had, if we had two more, just some ideas on how would we deploy them. Member Hollins. I want to respond to Member Ekstrom. I completely agree that in a rational world, we do a needs assessment, and then you make decisions based on that. But I think if we don't do anything, we're making a decision to have two more school resource officers because they're in the budget, and the budget's gone forward to City Council. So if we're a little bit in an awkward position, but I think I still think we need to do something. And it just occurred to me, listening uh, to our speaker, that we see the children and the needs when they're in school, from when they come in in the morning. I was talking to a principal today when I was picking up some flowers about children that have trauma, this, that, and I realized listening to you that the police know all of our families, really. Uh, and they see them after school, you know, what's going on. They're called into homes, and so they, they know a, percent of our children in a totally different way that we don't know. So it's kind of interesting. So, but I think if we don't do something, we're doing something. Member Karen. Uh, um, the mayor can have a line item and they can say yes to it, but we still can say no. They can have the money sitting there and we can still say no, you cannot come in. Am I understanding that correctly? Yes. Also, we discussed this at the meeting that we can make a recommendation to the town council that says we don't know we have do not feel we have been given adequate time to make a decision about this we do not feel comfortable making a decision forced on us quickly in a short period of time without a needs assessment we can make that recommendation to them and they can say you know what you're right you can wait a year we'll get back to you with a better proposal a more laid out plan and then you can decide or we can say nothing and they can vote it in and we can still make a decision after. I see what Susan's saying. It does feel like a statement if we do nothing. So. And. Um, so um, I will take one more round, um, but then I think we should actually wrap up. And before I take one more round, I'll just speak for myself. Um, you all have heard my opinion, uh, but I'll just quickly reiterate that um, generally speaking, I do not support the addition of two additional school resource officers to the SRO program. And this is because I don't believe that the origin of this proposal came from the school committee or the superintendent. Um, I really appreciate the Greenfield Police Department and I appreciate the relationship that we have with the Greenfield Police Department. And I actually think that the school resource officer memorandum of understanding that we currently have is a really good reflection of the priorities of not only the school committee, but also our community as a whole. And I really appreciate that. Um, I was around when we were first drafting that document. I know that there has been conversation about shortening it. It's quite long. Um, and there is, um, has been interest in reviewing the document just to clean it up a little bit. Um, and <clears throat> um, I think that we need to remember some of the voices that we've heard recently about our students and their feelings of safety and that we should be using our city resources to be supporting our schools and supporting, um, supporting our school budget. And now, with that being said, that doesn't mean that I don't support the police department budget being increased. I want to say that pretty clearly. If the school or if the police department believes they need two additional officers of some kind, then 
I would say that, you know, I'm not the person to, uh, you know, pass. I, I, I would trust that opinion. Now, um, again, just returning back to the fact that it's school resource officers that are getting proposed, um, I do have a say in that. We have a say in that. And um, at this time, I do not support adding two additional school resource officers. And then just quickly, I disagree partially with Member Holland's interpretation that if we do nothing this evening, um, we are essentially, I don't believe that we're waiving our authority in any way. It is true that we could end up with the police department having an additional, um, I believe it's $114,000 in their budget. Um, and, but again, we have the authority over this program. And so if that is the case, we would end up with um, a need to review, really thoroughly look at a needs assessment, and then um, you know make any decisions at that point. I do not believe that my opinion would change at that point. I think there are many different models for um, bridging gaps between police departments and community members. Um, and I am very interested in kind of keyed into what we've been hearing related to truancy support. So that's something that I believe to be very different than a school resource officer, although it is included in the MOU that we have now that um, the school resource officer can support uh, truancy related efforts. Um, Yeah, so that's, uh, I think that also for me, it's not just a funding thing. This is not just about money for me. Um, I believe that not everyone has the same response to police officers in the school buildings, and we need to be sensitive to that. I think as part of an overall assessment, we should be tapping into the opinions of our students um, and really hearing them out completely. Um, and then I did ask the superintendent if she wanted to comment on this, and she, she didn't leave me with a um, really comprehensive statement except that she supports the school committee budget that was put forward, and she supports um, putting funding into um, the schools through education and support services. And then also she wanted to let everyone know that she will be meeting with some students to get some input, and she has already had uh, solicited some kind of informal input from students, and that she takes this seriously and is looking for more information. Um, I hope that that is an accurate representation of what she said to me today. Uh, Member Ekstrom, did you have your hand up? Okay. Member Alexander, did you? Thank you. <clears throat> I was at that uh, subcommittee meeting where we had this long discussion on the HR, uh, on the uh, school resource officer, and I'm kind of caught between two things right now in the back, you know, going through my mind, is that if it's the intention to raise visibility and create goodwill with the community, um, I can't see three officers doing that. I can see a police officer as he's driving around on town saying hi to kids and making friends that way as well. Uh, I can see many other ways to enhance police presence or make the, promote goodwill, okay? Um, I can see having three officers is you're ratcheting up for a gunfight. And that's the only way I can physically see it. But sitting through this meeting to make an absolute determination to support anything, I just went through the minutes one more time and I stopped counting after seven questions that really need to be addressed that were brought up during that meeting before we actually make a decision uh, employing three full-time officers in the building. So I'm still, still having a lot of questions on do we have enough work for three guys to do? And finally, I guess the main, main part of it is this, um, by looking at the responsibilities of the school resource officers, someone recently just uh, mentioned uh, a couple of weeks ago that the 
school resource officer, he has to respond to a uh, young student in the elementary school if he's throwing chairs or he's having uh, a moment where he's out of control. Instead of having the resource officer handling that deal, a behaviorist is much more qualified and more educated to handle that behavior problem, thus lessening the current role of what we require a school resource officer doing. So I think a thorough look at the MOU and getting the rest of these questions answered, that's when I think that we'll definitely know exactly what we're going to need to have. And that's where I'm sitting at right now with it. Any further comments, questions? Member Hollins. Yes, comments. I feel really awkward with the discussion um, because the additional information I brought under new business was really a guide for working with youth and families, LGBTQ youth, where there's a huge issue with police. So, you know, I want to say something positive about the proposal, but it's not because I'm an advocate for police in the schools. So it's awkward to talk about. But I, I could vote. This is going. The money is currently in the police department budget for next year. I think from the discussions we've had about the police in the schools, we have enough issues about how to be sensitive, you know, what people should wear. In the elementary school, we want all the children to go visit the fire station, the police station. I mean, we're not adverse to children having some interaction with the police person. We have a role in whether the person is a male, a white male, a woman, a person of color, someone who's bilingual to help us with Spanish families. I mean, we still have a lot of control. So I see this as uh, unfortunate in a way how it came about, but it isn't to me so, un so terribly different than learning today that there's a grant that just came around. You've got two weeks to figure out are you going to apply for it or not. It feels a little bit like that. So I could vote for one additional officer, not two, and that we work to figure out how we might use the services in some mutually beneficial way that includes some of our needs like um, chronic attendance issues or, I mean, I have had the situation of parents coming into a school with a knife or a gun or something. I don't know. I think we could figure out how to do something that's sensitive and useful to both the police and the schools. For one additional person, it may not even mean they're in the school, but addressing some needs of the school. So I'm not here as a zealot for police in the schools, but I think we do have needs. Um, and that accepting one officer and figuring out a new guideline, how to, how to use the person in a way that works for all of us is possible. That's all. If we don't do something, then I think that I, I don't know how that works out next year. Okay, um, is that a motion? Are you putting a motion on the table? Well, I, I guess I will, just so that it wraps up if we want to say. My motion would be that we endorse no more than one additional school resource officer for FY19. And we work with the police chief on an amended MOU that addresses the needs of the school district and with full appreciation of the sensitivities of our students and families, as well as our needs for uh, intervention where the position could be helpful. So no more than one and we work on how to make it work. We, we talked about these several things came up in our meetings where you know like schools are stumped, parents don't come to pick up their children and then how do we get them over to the police or horrible traffic congestion, I don't know, it just seemed like there were issues that other than the image of people in armed guard walking around the schools, there were other things. Um, Secretary Farber, could you read that back to us?
Thank you. Is there a second? Okay, I'm seeing no second, so motion fails. Um, is there any further comment? Member Karen. I just wanted to say um, that we kind of talked a lot about some of the things that Susan Hollins brought up. Um, and one of the things we talked about was making sure that an SRO stayed as an SRO and a truancy officer was a truancy officer and that a police officer was a police officer. We didn't want a person to be doing too many roles and then having a different relationship with the children. We talked about a lot of it. Could we roll all of these into it? Could we not? Um, so that was a concern. And once again, I think that that's partly why myself, I would like a larger proposal and a needs assessment to see if we need truancy officer, if we need help with traffic. Is that a SRO? Is that not? So that's all I guess. Thank you, Member Karen. Um, any further comments? I think we should wrap this up. Okay, I'm seeing none. Um, Deputy Chief Williams, thank you very much for coming. We really appreciate you. Um, and again, your patience for waiting to speak. Um, and please extend our thanks to Chief Haig. I will. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks. So we will move on to the Foundation Budget Review Commission recommendation. This was tabled from our last meeting, and there should be a single page in your packet. Well, I don't see it here, though. Well, that's a little bit of a bummer. It was a summary. <laughs> it was a summary of the Foundation Budget Review Commission recommendations for changes to the foundation budget. Um, I brought this forward as a way for us to stand in solidarity with other school districts um, in requesting that changes be made to the foundation budget to reflect the true needs of school districts. Um, without the summary, I think it may be difficult for us to discuss, although it was included in last month's packet. Um, so at this time, it's kind of difficult for me to advocate for this. If you all haven't, don't have the information, I apologize for that. Um, we, we tabled this at our last meeting because, mainly because of time, but I think that it's really important for us to revisit this and perhaps move to table until next month. There was, um, I believe, the Reading School Committee recently voted also to support the recommendations of the Foundation Budget Review Commission. Just today I saw that announcement. And there is a long list of school districts on the MASC website, um, all of them standing together to raise our voices, just raise the volume, turn up the dial, um, that we have additional needs that are not being addressed by the current foundation budget. Um, so, I guess, is if there's an interest in continuing the conversation in June, um, I would entertain a motion to table until June to have more information brought forward. And if not, we can essentially drop it. <laughs> I move to table the conversation until June. Is there a second? Second. Okay, any further conversation? Okay, all those in favor of tabling Foundation Budget Review Commission until June? Aye. Aye. Member Hollins, aye. That's unanimous. Thank you. Okay, our next item is City and Schools Human Resources. Um, and this is <clears throat> to address part of what the subcommittee recommendation brought forward related to human resources. And the MOU that was in discussion for a very long time, or a potential MOU, um, I believe that discussion between the schools through the superintendent 
um, and the HR on the city side and the mayor's office um, lasted for about or maybe a little over a year it's been a long time now um, I did touch base with the superintendent today to get a little clarity on this and I was reminded that the munis conversion that the city and schools have um, been going through will actually provide a an online resource for city employees to include um, member benefits so my understanding is that the recommendation that was put forward earlier this evening by member alexander to review and explore a digital um, either, like either a website or some kind of digital presence that uh, answered common questions related to city benefits that that may actually be coming forward through the final phase of the munis conversion so I just want everyone to know that information um, and it sounds like even without knowing it we are all on the same page so look at that um, I don't I think that there are a couple things that can help us with this particular item and one would be a motion to formally um, stop conversation related to the human resources MOU with the city um, and then the other would be to potentially put forward a motion similar to the recommendation which would be to support um, either the exploration or implementation of a digital resource for city employees to answer um, common questions related to benefits um, and those are all my comments on this um, Member Alexander, did you want to follow up on some of what the subcommittee had to say? Uh, if you wish, I'd go ahead and make the, uh, make the motion, if you want. Sure. What? W go for it. What okay, are you moving? Okay. Let's see if I can take a wing at this one. Um, I would like to move that we, the school committee of the Greenfield Public School District, uh, officially announce that we are not no further no longer interested in further conversation or deliberation about creating a human resources memorandum of instruction with the city of greenfield and that we would prefer to consider the human resources digital human resources option for em employee services thank you member alexander is there a second Second by member Ekstrom. Um, is there any conversation on this? Member Hollins. I think employee services is awfully broad. Could we, the discussion was specific to insurance and retirement programs. Could we limit it to that? Because I think that's where school personnel and city personnel we keep talking about who's going to enroll people for insurance and who's going to enroll them for retirement. And the, I think the idea was if the city would put, you know, information and commonly asked questions online, we wouldn't have to keep having this discussion about which. But I think it was specific. Um, would you be interested in amending your language slightly? Um, can we work out the language? Could you read back, Susan, what you have right now? And the suggestion is to change employee services to address uh, inquiries related to member benefits? Or related employee to benefits? employee retirement and insurance benefits. 
Do you think the beginning of the motion's a little strident? <laughs> I think <laughs> we could they, refine it. Uh, it probably refine reflects that. everyone's feeling, but it might be a bit strident. Do you have a suggestion? There was some, just a little phrase, and they were a lo no longer interested. Maybe we could say, um, this time, well, not, it's not in our interest to pursue. We're just, I'm not sure I have the right wording. It's a very long motion, but. Okay, um, perhaps something like. I can't remember the whole one. Um, Currently, the members of the school committee. Um, that it's in the interest of efficient use of time. Um, do not see the benefit of pursuing or something. Or maybe that's too. Maybe leave it the way Don made it. I agree with the sentiment. We need to put it to bed. We're using a lot of time and going nowhere. Okay. Um, uh, Susan Farber, could you read back what you, ha what, what you have right now? She has a master's now? degree in English. Maybe <laughs> <laughs> By the way. Um, Don's, Don's with um, the amendment at the, at the end, at the tail, there was a change in um, employee benefits. Okay. And Member Hollins, when you questioned um, working together, you mean on the digital resource, you mean is, in collaboration with the schools that and the... Is the city should work on this or that we should collaborate in some way? It doesn't matter to me, I'm just wondering what the thought is. <laughs> we're not willing, we're not thinking we should get together on this human resource position, but are we asking them to do it? <laughs> um, well, so I think that it is actually happening, as I mentioned, with the Munis conversion. I'm not sure when that rollout date would be. Um, and the language is to support, is that right? Um, the digital resource before to consider. Um, I Perhaps we should amend the language to support the implementation of a digital resource to serve the need that's written there. <laughs> You're voting yes, however, okay. Um, so when you have it down, Susan, maybe you'll read back what we've just compiled, yeah. Don's, yep. Officially announce that we are no longer interested in further conversation or deliberation about creating a human resources MOU with the city of Greenfield, and that we support the implementation, sorry, we support the implementation of the digital resources to address inquiries related to the employee retirement and insurance benefits. Okay. Member Alexander, that's a slight change from what you put forward. Does, is that acceptable to you? Okay, after about 15 minutes of us uh, <laughs> trying to play wordsmith here, yeah, I can accept that as a amendment to the my original motion. All I want is I just want this issue off of my subcommittee's agenda forever. 
Okay, thank you. Um, and I'm assuming, Member Ekstrom, you were the second, weren't you? You don't have a problem with the second on that? I am still the second. Great. Okay, is there any further deliberation? Okay, all right, I'm seeing no further deliberation. Um, all those in favor? Aye, that is unanimous. Thank you very much, and much appreciation to everyone who helped to put those words together. Can I make one last comment? Sure. Be because our record will show, just to show on our record, in all the discussion, there has been no evidence that any money would be saved or that either the city or the school department would be able to decrease staff. And so that's the reason it seems kind of purposeless at the moment. Thank you, Member Hollins. Um, so we are moving on to number five, which is policies for second reading. We have three different policies that are up for second reading. Um, and they should all be here in your packet. We saw them at our last meeting for first reading. Um, this time we actually do need to read through the amended policies and if Member Alexander would like to start, that would be fantastic um, with JKA. Yes, Member Ekstrom. Yeah. support that. Um, is okay. that a motion? That is a motion. Okay. Se is there a second? I only have two policies in my Okay. Opinion. Member Hollins is a second. Um, so I believe that the motion is to move school requests for maintenance and safe transportation up to right now? Yes. Okay. Um, all those, any discussion on this? Um, my only point is that um, this is actually a really small agenda item. Um, I'm not sure if there's any comment from administrator on it. Okay, I wasn't aware of any. Um, I, I do also think that um, Director Ellis is here to potentially answer any questions related to the policies that we have for second reading. So um, I actually think that we should not amend the agenda and keep it in the order that it's in. Is there any other deliberation? Okay, all those in favor of changing the agenda order? Uh, all those against? Okay, everyone's ag were you I against? Okay. <laughs> Are you yes, no, or abstain? I'll just abstain, I don't Okay, Member Hollins abstain. So the motion fails. So we will stick with the current order, which is um, to second readings of, <coughs> pardon me, policies JKAA, JLD, and JLDE. Um, Member Alexander, please start us off with the second reading of the revised policy JKAA. Okay, so you want me to read the whole policy to you? Okay, so at this late hour, it's like reading you guys a bedtime story. Okay, second reading of proposed policy JKAA, physical restraint of students. Maintaining an orderly, safe environment conducive to learning is an expectation of all staff members of the school district. Further, Students of the district are protected by law from the unreasonable use of physical restraint. Such restraint shall be used only in emergency situations as a last resort and with an extreme caution after other lawful and less intrusive alternatives have failed or have been deemed inappropriate. When an emergency situation arises, a physical and physical restraint is the only option deemed appropriate to prevent a student from injuring himself or herself, another student or school community member, a teacher or employee or agent of the school district may use such reasonable force needed to protect students from other persons or themselves from assault 
or imminent serious physical harm. Definitions of forms of restraint shall be defined in 603 CMR 46.02. The use of mechanical restraint, medical restraint, and seclusion is prohibited. Physical restraint, including one prone restraint where permitted under 603 CMR 46.03, shall be considered an emergency procedure of the last resort and shall be prohibited except when a student's behavior poses a threat of assault or imminent serious physical harm to themselves and or others and the student is not responsible responsive to verbal directives or other lawful and less intrusive behavior interventions are deemed inappropriate. The, super, <clears throat> the superintendent will develop procedures identifying point one appropriate responses to student behavior that may require immediate intervention. Point two, methods of preventing student violence, self-injurious behavior, and suicide, including crisis planning and de-escalation of potential, potentially dangerous behaviors amongst groups of students or individuals. Point three, descriptions and explanations of alternatives to physical restraint as well as the school's method of physical restraint for the use in emergency situations. Point four, descriptions of the school's training and procedures to comply with reporting requirements including, but not limited to, making reasonable efforts to orally notify a parent of the use of restraint within 24 hours of its imposition. Procedures, point five, procedures for receiving and investigating complaints and the last one, methods for engaging parents in discussions about restraint prevention and use of restraint solely as an emergency procedure. I think it continues on the next, on the back. There's more. Yep. No, that's a, oh, that no, is No, it continues with points the same policy. Mm -hmm. That's why I said we only have two policies. Oh, it's continuing policies. on. So we are missing one of the three. Uh, so this is a reading. continuation of. Let's keep, keep going on with this and All then right, we'll talk reading. about it. <clears throat> Next point, statement prohibiting medication restraint, mechanical restraint, prone restraint unless permitted by 603 CMR 4603 Bolex 1 lowercase b. Seclusion and the use of physical restraint in the manner inconsistent with 603 CMR 46-00. A process for obtaining principal approval for a timeout exceeding 30 minutes. Each building principal will identify staff members to serve as a school wide resource to assist in ensuring proper administration of physical restraint. These staff members will participate in an in depth training program in the use of physical restraint. In addition, each staff member will be trained regarding the school's physical restraint policy and accompanying procedures. The principal will arrange training to occur in the first month of each school year or for hired staff after the beginning of the school year within a month of their employment. Physical restraint is prohibited as a means of punishment or as a response to destruction of property, disruption of school order, a student's refusal to comply with a school rule or a staff directive or verbal threats that do not constitute an imminent serious physical harm to student or others. Physical restraint is prohibited when it is medically wow, uh, contradicted for reasons including but not limited to asthma, seizures, cardiac condition, obesity, <coughs> bronchitis, communication related disabilities or risk of vomiting. The use of timeout procedures during which a staff member remains accessible to the student shall not be considered seclusion restraint. This policy and accompanying procedures shall be reviewed and disseminated to staff annually and will be made available to parents of enrolled students. The superintendent shall provide a copy of the physical restraint regulations to each principal who shall sign a form acknowledging receipt thereof. The source is from the Massachusetts Association of School Committees and the legal references is Massachusetts General Law 71 
37 uh, g and 603 CMR 4600. Thank you, Member Alexander. Is there a motion to approve the modified JKAA policy? A motion to approve. Is there a second? Can I second? You have to second. Yeah, we have to second. second. Yeah. Great, thank you. Second by Member Ekstrom. Um, yes, Member Ekstrom. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, so tw within 24 hours is far too long. You need to notify people immediately if their child has been restrained. Where are you, please? Uh, oh, point point four. number four. 24 hours is far too long. We also need to talk about what physical restraint is because of my own, I'll use my own kid as an example. My daughter took jars of paint and tossed them in the room all over the place, destroyed the room. No one was able to walk over to her and put their hand on her arm and say, Cameron, pull it together, because that would be considered a physical restraint. So um, I think we need to talk about that a little bit more. Timeout is a nice way of saying seclusion, unless the timeout is in the same room as where something is, where the class is being held. Seclusion is not necessarily a bad thing, there are people who need the space to settle down. And it's seclusion and restraint are not the same thing. Seclusion is seclusion, restraint is restraint. Seclusion is, seclusion is when used properly, is a therapeutic intervention. When used improperly, is not a therapeutic intervention. So I think if we're gonna talk about this, then we need to talk about this. You know, the, um, what is this? Physical restraint is prohibited when a medically contra contradicted, contradicted communication related disabilities. People who are in that kind of, uh, people who are overwhelmed, their brain no longer functions the way it's supposed to. You go into fight or flight. And so a lot of this is, there's a lot of gray area that this doesn't address. And in my particular situation would, was um, inappropriate to not be used. And, and you know, in, inappropriate's not the right word. Somebody put their hand on my daughter's arm, would have been fine. Didn't do that. But that would be a physical restraint had they done it. So. I think there's a gray area that's being missed. Um, do you, is there an interest in asking these questions to Director Ellis? And Director Ellis, are you interested in could, <laughs> speaking could to we, some of this? Could we maybe go through some other yeah, questions? Yeah, absolutely, um, absolutely. Um, Member Hollins, go ahead. Well, I just want to say in response to Susan Ekstrom's comments, um, there are students with autism on the autism spectrum who are overwhelmed by sensory Absolutely. stimulation. Absolutely. And in fact, re removing them from the stimulation. I think Susan raised a very good point. But these are the comments I'd like to make about the policy. Um, there's some reference here to several places about himself or herself. I, I think we should watch for that because even the Department of Ed is now doing data based on male, female, and, and non-conforming. I mean, we're not in a himself, herself binary world anymore. So maybe we could look at the wording like in the second paragraph, uh, when a situation arises and restraints the only option deemed appropriate to prevent a student from self-injurious behavior and we should try to get away from gender descriptions. And also in the second paragraph, the third sentence at the end says, an agent of school district may use such reasonable force. I think we need to say for physical restraint. And then what I notice is we have a section, and I think that's really helpful, called definitions. Da -da 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 -da. 
And then we have a section at the bottom of page one where the superintendent will develop procedures. And when you turn it over, there's three paragraphs that are specific to prohibitions. It's paragraph, I don't know. Not the bullets, but otherwise the third, fourth, and fifth, like physical restraints prohibited. In this situation, it's prohibited in the next, and seclusion is prohibited. So it seems to me that should be a section, just prohibitions. Um, and I want to make one other comment on the first paragraph on the reverse side. Each building principal will identify staff, staff members, only staff members, to serve as a school-wide resource to assist. So I can remember walking through the schools one time. I'm not a trained staff member in physical restraint in the particular school, and there was a child, and there just weren't enough people around. So the principal said, Susan, I want you to do this. And so I was called in to help because there were people, and it could be a parent, you know, where someone says, here's what's going on, uh, parent so-and-so, we'd like you to do this. So I'm just mentioning that I don't disagree with, you know, each building principal or identify staff. Sometimes you've got to ask someone who's not a staff member, Adrian's walking through the school, and it may be necessary to ask Adrian to do something. But lastly, it's really helpful to me to see what's changing, and I don't know what's changing from our old policy, and I appreciate the work, but those are my comments. Member Karen. Um, I guess Diane will probably say this. Um, the definition of forms of restraint is listed there. You have to go to the statute. I believe that this is the Department of Education law. This is not an opinion piece. This is not, this was us coming up to law. We were not at law yet. So this, we took this, worked from the MASC recommendation. This is almost exactly what they said. Um, so that I want to be, I want to make sure that I'm correct in that. So Diane can. Hi everyone. So Diane Ellis, Director of People Services. I felt a little bit more alert and fresh a few hours ago. Um, we all agree. So, so um, I will try to um, certainly speak coherently. Um, yes, as Member Karen had said, this uh, proposed policy is um, very much uh, adopted or uh, um, uh, modeled after the mask policy, which uh, um, districts were to take into effect in 2016. Uh, we were cited on this specifically in our coordinated program review. Uh, I have done a second progress report to the state and I've had to update the state on our progress in adopting a policy that is in compliance with the 2016 law. Um, I will say um, for the, mem the benefits of the committee and for members at uh, home who may be still listening uh, or viewing this program that um, our procedures are very much in aligned with the 2016 law. Our policy, however, is not. So we as a district have moved forward in implementing procedures. Staff have been trained on the difference between seclusion and timeout, and I would agree that timeout as a intervention is very effective for students who are flooded or overwhelmed, who have sensory experiences. Um, so having a break in a calm down area um, and uh, calm down rooms are not unsupervised. There's always a staff person present and that's really the shift in the law in 2016 is that we do not want children who are in a state of escalation to be alone or to be isolated or secluded. So having a child in a uh, calm down area, having a child take a time out is a, a, a form of intervention. Um, the other change that uh, was really a highlight uh, from the 2016 law is that restraint cannot be used as a form of a behavior intervention plan for someone who has significant or severe disabilities. Restraint is not a tool. St restraint is really a, uh, an intervention of last resort as the language in this model policy uh, states. So, uh, you know, we're really, um, we are hoping to um, I, I understand the gender, non-conforming gender point, uh, Member Hollins, but I do um, want to urge the committee to really bring our policy in line with the 2016 regulations um, so that we can certainly satisfy, satisfy our state requirements, but also have our policy 
uh, really um, reflect the practices that we've incorporated in the Greenfield schools. Thank you, Director Ellis. Mm -hmm. uh, Member Hollins. I appreciate that MASC policy, sometimes they need rewording even when it's an MASC policy. You said something that I think is very important and I don't see in the policy. You said that physical restraint is an intervention of last resort. That's worded so well. It says here only in a music, yes, it does say emergency situations as a last resort. And you said we do not want students in a state of behavior escalation to be alone. In other words, at all times someone would be with a student. I don't see that mentioned here, and I think that's a great policy um, statement. So, um, so just uh, so Member Hollins and uh, members of the committee, we have uh, implementation guidelines that accompany this policy. So that are uh, multiple pages long. This is a policy that is um, more broad-based and really has the legal, legal language of the law. Our implementation guidelines are really specific and also uh, we have a district PowerPoint presentation that principals have um, um, utilized with their staff in training so that everyone has consistent language on what is the definition of seclusion, what is the definition of timeout, how do we um, only you know trained members who are uh, um, trained in uh, crisis prevention intervention um, approaches are involved in um, de-escalation of situations in students where it may lead to needing to escort a student again it is a um, restraint is something that is used of last resort and uh, we do report all restraints to the state. There are lots of reporting requirements on There's very specific requirements on the form that's used. There's specific requirements on parent notifications. Um, typically, parents are notified the same day. I want to be very responsive to Member Ekstrom's um, comments that 24 hours is way too long. Um, I would think that that would be an exception rather than any type of practice. Uh, you know the the expectation that is communicated in our implementation guidelines is that parents are notified as, you know as soon as possible and within 24 hours it may be that you call a phone number there the voicemail box is full you may try to send an email communication i mean there's sometimes i i've known in my experience as an administrator and as a, a former building principal sometimes you just cannot reach a person the same day as you would like to um, despite our various methods of communicating. Um, but there also is a written follow-up process that is in place, um, notifying parents as well as giving parents an opportunity to uh, express their views, parents or guardians, on um, how they feel about what happened in the interaction with their child. And there's also a debriefing and de-escalation protocol that is in place for in a situation to help rebuild and restore that relationship. And you can imagine if somebody has to be in an escalated state and someone has to secure them for uh, in the purposes of restraint for to, to keep them safe from self-harm or harming others in an imminent way, uh, then it's important that that bridging of the relationship, that communication happens so that the student understands that that adult uh, and those staff members continue to be, you know, trusting, supporting people in their, you know, in their school program, in their school day. So uh, there's a lot that has gone into the training um, protocols, the communication, the forms, the reporting. Um, as a director of student services, um, I feel really um, very comfortable with um, the procedures that are in place within the Greenfield schools, and I very much, um, you know, uh, would like to see our policy um, be addressed by the committee uh, in, in language that people are comfortable with so that we can have a, a, a voted policy uh, hopefully in the near future. Thank you, Director Ellis. Um, any other questions or comments? Are you taking wording recommendations? Sure, yeah. Mm -hmm. Member Holland. Um, paragraph 2 to change a student from injuring himself or herself to to prevent a student from self-injurious behavior. That was second paragraph, second line, 
Right now it says to prevent the student from injuring himself or herself. And I'm recommending we get rid of himself or herself and prevent a student from self-injurious behavior. Or self-injury or something. I just I have a quick question. Yes, Member Karen. Um, when I agree with the need to change himself and herself, is it uh, accurate to use themselves? Or them, or they? Yeah, and they maybe. make it plural to prevent students from injuring themselves. That I was, was just that's question. another way to do it. Okay. Yeah. I know that. Injuring themselves or others. I would support that. Um, Member Hollins, did you have additional edits? Mm hmm. I think it really makes sense to say what's prohibited, but if you look at the, after the first two paragraphs, there's a sentence about definition, and then there's one statement about prohibition. The use of mechanical restraint, medical restraint, is prohibited. And then on the other side, there's three paragraphs about what's prohibited, and they should all be together. I don't see why this one prohibition is on the first page and three paragraphs of what's prohibited is on the back page without that sentence. I just, I would move it. So, again, you'd like to move the sentence, the uh, use of... The use of mechanical restraint is prohibited over in the section with what's prohibited. There's three paragraphs of what's prohibited. <coughs> So to place it um, after paragraph two on the second page? Sure. I also have a question about that. Do you think it's possible that it's there so that we get the main points out as quickly as possible and then delve into what those are later? I'm just asking. Well, so just the a three paragraphs are different. One is that one is explaining that you can't use physical restraint as a punishment. That has nothing to do with mechanical restraint or seclusion, particularly. And the, no, the next is you can't use physical restraint if it's medically contraindicated. So that doesn't really connect to mechanical restraint, particularly. And the other is time out. Oh, there's only two on what's prohibited. So I, don't, I think they're all different statements about prohibition. Okay, any other comments or questions? Yes, Susan Farber. Um, Member Hollins, I'm hearing one really clear recommendation, which is to change line two, paragraph two, page one, from to be, to use inclusive gender terminology. Yep, um, and then in your next suggestion, I did not hear a clear recommendation. The sentence that reads as follows on the first page, the use of mechanical restraint, medical restraint, and seclusion is prohibited. Be moved, just as written, above the paragraph that says physical restraint is prohibited as a means of punishment. So that all three statements about prohibitions are together. I'm just taking a minute to take that in. I'd even put a little heading prohibitions. Okay, so, um, so then I'm hearing you say three things, and these are suggestions Suggestions for edits. Um, including the prohibitions header, 
on the back page, moving, the use of mechanical restraint, medical restraint, and seclusion is prohibited to the last page, um, and using gender inclusive uh, pronouns. So, um, my response is that I am in favor of using in inclusive language, and I actually believe that we should be keeping everything as written um, because I think that the way that it's written it does serve as a kind of clear introduction to what's prohibited underneath it even um, physical restraint including prone res restraint where prohibited where permitted under CO3 CMR 46.3 just under that um, it talks about um, use of physical restraint as an emergency procedure of last resort and then also talks about it being prohibited. So I don't think that the flow is necessarily confusing. Um, and then I would just say that if we want to make these major changes, it may be helpful for us to see it written out and bring it back to the table in June. Um, were you the first, you, you put forward the motion? Yes. Um, so I think Member Holland said these essentially are uh, amendments to the motion. Um, One more question. Yeah, Member Hollins. Could you explain why the sentence, physical restraint, including prone restraint, were permitted under da 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 4603, why that is? in italics and underlined? That is the new language to the policy. The underlined italics is brand new language. It's being put in. So are we it changing our protocol of just making it bold? It's yeah, but so that will be gone in the policy? Okay. When the policy's cleaned up, the, itali the italicized uh, font and the underlining will be changed to match the rest of the document. I just put that in there, and when, I <clears throat> when this originally came up last month, there was a, the original document that came with it, so you had both documents in front of you. But... Uh, I didn't see the first one make it back, so. Okay, thank you. Any other comments, questions? Okay, there is a motion on the table to accept, to approve the proposed policy um, as it was written. Um, do we want to make any amendments to that uh, motion? I would be okay with an amendment to change the language to be non-gender specific um, from injuring themselves or something like that. And that feels like something we could do and not have to have a full readout again. But mm -hmm. Second. Okay. Um, so let's vote on that amendment to um, change I think it might be just in that one, I think it's just that one spot. One spot. Um, line two of paragraph two. Do you have it, Susan Farber, as themselves or self injurious behavior? Okay. Thank you. Um, all those in favor of that amendment? Aye, right, that's unanimous. Okay. And so we do still have a motion now on the table, which would be to make that change to paragraph two and approve the proposed JKAA policy. Um, any further discussion on that? Okay, all those in favor? I am, um, that is unanimous. Thank you. Um, so it is true that there is JLD that is missing from our packet, this is probably just a simple mistake because I believe we were putting JLD forward without any changes. Um, 
just to be formal about it, I think we should table it and bring it to the next meeting um, since it's not here for us to look at. Yes, Member Alexander. Uh, it does serve my memory, and I was looking at my notes. There was a change with JLD, but we okay. probably need to have JLD here so that we can look at JLD-E because it's, okay. half, it's half a cup of coffee. Okay, so um, are you putting or forward a motion to table JLD and JLDE until June? Uh, yeah, I would like to move that we table uh, second readings on policy JLD guidance program and JLDE guidance program uh, to the June meeting for a second reading at that time. Is there a second? Second. Second by Member Hollins. Um, any discussion? Okay. Uh, yes, Director Ellis. I'm sorry, the, the point I wanted to make was not specific to JLDE, but another policy topic that is related. So To JLD and JLDE or? Uh, not to those two policies. Okay, let's. That policy or that exhibit, no. Okay, let's vote on this and yes, then sorry. I will happily take your comment. Um, all those in favor of tabling until June? Okay, that's unanimous. Thank you. Um, Director Ellis. Um, so respectful request to the policy uh, subcommittee, which hopefully can um, bring this before the full committee for our June meeting, is that our, uh, it was tabled from, I believe, our March uh, 24th meeting, uh, is policy JJ, our extracurricular activities policy. Um, I don't have the document in front of me or on my phone. But it, there is um, the need to add uh, a little bit more inclusive language to that policy around gender identity and homelessness um, that we want to, the three policies were identified uh, in our coordinated program review, um, uh, JKAA, JLD, and policy JJ. And I just, um, in the, um, I know we're looking at um, the policy subcommittee has been very busy, but I just want to bring this back to your attention. Yes, that's much appreciated. Thank you. Yes, Member Alexander. Uh, yeah, could you read off those policies you need? Because I'm adding it to my work list for the next subcommittee. All right, and this is a test of my mental strength on this day. <laughs> uh, so from my memory, uh, so uh, JKAA, which the committee has worked on tonight, so our physical restraint policy. Uh, JLD, which is our uh, guidance to student services. Uh, I think we are actually talking about changing the language from gu guidance to student services, if I'm remembering correctly, um, which we just tabled to June. And then the third policy, uh, which was very, very, very small language change that we want to add um, to update language around gender identity and homelessness, uh, is policy JJ. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Um, where is my agenda? I lost it. So um, at this time, we have the a proposal from the MASC related to policy work um, and this came up at subcommittee and I will yield the floor to member Alexander if you want to introduce this okay give me a second I gotta find where I wrote it I'm sorry one moment Can, is director Ellis I call you yeah. Diane all the time is she she's all set to go <laughs> I just wanted to say thank you for joining our discussion about physical restraints. It's a, it's a hard discussion for a lot of people and you are so eloquent about it and are really great about educating not only the school committee but also the community at large about the policies that, or not policies, the practices that the district has adopted and is improving upon. So thank you so much for that. <laughs> You're thank dismissed. Thank you. Thanks a lot. <laughs> Okay. Um. Okay, thank you for buying me some time while I found the piece of paper here. Uh, at this time, the policy 
program subcommittee would like to recommend that the school committee in, uh, begin a three-year subscription with the Massachusetts Association of School Committees Policy One Review Program to assist us in our need to act, make accurate policies and to update and review policies over the next three-year period in order to provide clear guidance for the superintendent and the district. And also in your packet tonight, you have a small handout here describing the services that is provided with this program. And also in the packet, you have a copy of the uh, proposal for manual development. Okay. okay. Oh. oh, sorry. Go ahead. Oh. Did you have more? <laughs> sorry. Huh? No, I was just going <laughs> to open up and get us started on this. I guess sure. If it was okay with you. So um, I just wanted I just wanted to jump in and clarify. So there's there are multiple services that the MACSC offers um, to school committees, and um, the Policy 21 pamphlet that's here. This um, is different than the one that was in your packet. Um, the Policy 21 is more of an online uh, hosting of our policies and working sort of with a remote assistant who would post the policies online um, and help to keep us uh, up to date. We would, it would essentially um, be taking some of the work that is now in-house um, to, to the MASC. Um, and then there is a multiple page document that is representative of it is a sample contract with the MASC to utilize their, um, essentially their um, policy support service, which would designate one representative from the MASC to work closely with our school committee at regular subcommittee meetings um, to work through the policy manual, to provide um, guidance in developing policy, to offer up uh, new policies that maybe um, need to be implemented due to changes in the law, to help to keep us up to date um, legally, to help um, us in doing our job um, keeping track of policy. Now, the way that it's described um, in, on the website is that it's a three-year commitment. Um, however, you'll see in this, in this uh, contract that this contract suggests that it would not take three years. This is an older estimate that was given to us um, a few years back. However, my understanding is that the MASC has indicated that the cost in the proposal would be very similar, that the dates would just be updated. Um, and again, my understanding is that a, an individual representative from the MSC would essentially s stay with us in partnership to work through our policy manual and ensure that everything is up to date. Yes, Member Hollins. The first, three, the first three advantages of this uh, proposal is that our policies can be put online. Our, our policies are already online. They're posted on our website. Okay. I'm on this one. It's, they're bullets. It says putting your documents online reduces hard copies. And by posting your policies online, gives staff members another tool and it's convenient and accessible. So I just want to say our policies are already fully online on our website. And the fourth bullet, users are able to search an online manual by word or phrase. I don't know about that, but anyway. So that's all I want to say is that we're already online. So that's 
Thanks, Member Hollins. There was some discussion at the subcommittee level, I think two subcommittee meetings ago, about specifically this policy 21, which is the online service, which is essentially hosting our policies online in a easy searchable way. Um, and the subcommittee actually ultimately was not excited about it and did not recommend putting that forward to the full committee. Um, however, informally, the um, superintendent has conferred with some of her staff who is responsible for posting our policies online and um, has indicated that utilizing the Policy 21 service could be a real benefit for us. Um, I obviously can't speak any more to that opinion um, because I don't really know any more about the superintendent's um, conversation with our staff about it. I do think that from the surface level and from the conversation that we had at the subcommittee, it felt like, okay, we're already doing this. Like some of the things that uh, we have to do anyway, we're still just going to have to do. Um, and it didn't necessarily represent something that we wanted to do at the time. So that policy 21 is actually separate from the more comprehensive uh, policy support. Um, and so the difference here is that with the policy 21, you don't have somebody coming to help you through crafting policy. That's not what the service is. The service is essentially just to host the uh, policies online and I don't even know if they're necessarily technically hosting it but they help to um, ensure that our policies are up to date online um, however the policy manual development is different and it takes over um, it takes place over the course of at least one year um, and up to three years and it is one individual assigned to us to work through our policy manual, policy by policy, um, very closely to ensure that our policies are up to date and that we um, are supported in the work that we're doing with our policies. And the cost for that is, I believe $10,000 that's stretched out over the course of the time that we work with them. Um, my, I support this idea um, and in working with MASC mainly because I believe this to be an extension of our professional development as a school committee and I believe that we would really benefit from having this service provided to us to help us through our policy development um, and to help to ensure that um, we are moving at a pace that works for everyone and that we are keeping up with the law. Um, I also am aware that depending upon the start date of this, this may also bridge the transition between the current school committee configuration and the incoming school committee configuration, um, which will be happening before we know it. <laughs> um, so I, I I think that through working with the MASC closely, we can help to keep some continuity throughout. Did you have? Are you actually Member Ekstrom. Um, so in looking at this policy 21, just because I do spend so much time online and you know websites and whatever, I will say that the advantage of this is the resource links being added within each of the policies would be a a huge time saver um, and with all the cross-referencing. So essentially what they do is they do a link to, um, you know, to see policy, whatever, and then you don't have to go out and look for it yourself. You just click on the link and it goes to that policy and, you know, then you can look, look at it there. Now, having so, could we do that ourselves? Absolutely. I mean, it's not that difficult to do. On the other hand, it would cost us more in time and energy than $3,500 to be able to do that. So, I mean, that's, that if we are, if we want to talk about policy 21 and, and think about it that way, I think it's a valuable resource. Outside of that, it really is just hosting. Doing it that first year and getting them to do all the work and the cross-referencing and all that stuff, and then walking away from it, an excellent plan. Otherwise, eh. 
That's my thought. Yes, Member Alexander. Yeah, I'd like to go ahead and speak to what's been going on actually in the subcommittee. Uh, this uh, first came up back in February where we had a, a discussion on it. And in our February meeting, we were all uh, leaned towards uh, us rolling our sleeves up and pulling out the binder. And I think the chair and committee member Karen, we were going to go occupy a conference room somewhere and lock ourselves in and just grunge out the work. And that was going to be numerous amounts of hours of research and trying to clean up the manual. Um, the two things that I am I do feel good about is the fact that they do have a designated representative that's going to be working with us. They are still our policies. We still have to vote and adopt them. And uh, but it also brings somebody who's looking at policy all day long and they can advise us and tell us little things that we don't know or we, you know, we kind of miss. So instead of us having to work many, many hours of trying to update the binder, we're bringing in someone to kind of help us push it along a little quicker. And I have been surf searching through this uh, policy, or one of those, this website, and basically you just enter one word and it's going to tell you every policy in the state that gives, that has reference to that certain issue that you're looking up. So there is a technological ease to it. Member Karen. So, um if we do the big policy, do we get the benefits of the little thing? Are I believe they they're two separate things. Couldn't remember the answer. Yeah. Thank you. Member Hans. I know some of the people listed as field staff, and they have very different backgrounds. If you could get Tracy Novick, who's the person who's always advising everybody across the street. I've never met Tracy Novick, but the person's terrific, knows every law. If you get someone that doesn't, you don't have as a really great background, to me it wouldn't be as great. But what I wanted to say is we're bringing on, hopefully bringing on a new business manager, and we're just setting some goals, I think. And from working with policy the last two years, we, we have, I think, if I sat down with Don, about 20 policies that are halfway through a pipeline, including some regulations for, you know, they were, they were in different sections of the policy manual based on things that came up, whether they were in transportation or student services. So there were, there, there's about a half a year's work just trying to get ourselves finished with things that are done. So if we did this, I would prefer that we have some say in who works with us and that we finish what's in the pipeline, which I've read some more material. This has come up about three times over the last, over the years that I've been here. I think the way they do it is one section at a time. Um, so it's the same amount of work for us because our policy on policy says we bring things forward and we have to go through them twice. It's, so we have 400 policies and we've updated most of two sections. But we have this cornucopia of policies that we had a first reading and are waiting to come back. So I would rather we finish the work on the table. It's not just one section at a time. And that would probably take us with a new business manager and setting goals and then maybe in the start of the year, go to a policy service when we clean up what we're doing. I feel really lousy about a couple of things that are that were put on hold or passed from meeting to meeting that have seemed really important to finish. Thanks, Member Hollins. Um, okay. Um, do we want to entertain a motion at all? I know we've had some deliberation on this. Um, is anyone interested in putting forward a motion to support implementation of policy 21 and or policy manual development with AMASE? Yes, Member Hollins. Well, I'm mindful that we have two important members that aren't here tonight <coughs> that are going to be impacted by a decision to start working with another person meeting with us. So I'd, I'd like to move that we consider the uh, MASC policy service for January of 219, and we spend the next six months working to complete policies in the pipeline. 
Is there a second? I'm hearing no second, so motion fails. Member Karen? I, I do completely support this, but I do hear Member Holland's thought that we have, do not have two people here. And so I would like to move that we table this conversation and not for June, but maybe for July or August. Uh, we have too much coming up, but if we table it for now, it doesn't go away. And I don't think that even if we pass this in July, we will actually be starting any time before January. I, I find that hard, hard to believe that would actually I, happen. I agree with passing it to the full committees here. Is there a second? Second. Okay. Um, I will just follow up with that there is an, this, I will follow up with Member Hollins um, to get the information that the subcommittee has requested related to subcommittee work that was done last year when Member Hollins was the chairperson. And I know that uh, Member Alexander, I don't know if you two ever met, I know that there was some plan for doing that um, and making sure that uh, we were clear on what work has already been done um, and the work needed moving forward. Um, and other than that, I would just say that I support, I absolutely support utilizing the MASC policy manual development service, um, and I am a little on the fence about policy 21. Okay, motions on the table to table until July or August. All those in favor of tabling? Okay, and I'm a no. And that motion passes. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. Um, so the next item is the Unit C MOU. This here is a memorandum of understanding between the Greenfield Public Schools and the Greenfield Education Association. I'll read it. Um, this is something that we uh, that applies to longevity for Unit C members. This is the. The Greenfield Public Schools and the Greenfield Education Association agree to clarify their interpretation of the Unit C Collective Bargaining Agreement as follows. The parties agree that the intent of the longevity language contained in Appendix A of the Unit C Collective Bargaining Agreement, quote, entitlement to longevity will be based on the number of years of service as of July 1st each year, dot, 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 uh, end quote, is meant to reward Unit C members for service of complete school years. Therefore, effective as of the 2017-18 school year, the parties agree that bargaining unit members hired on or by September 15th of a given school year shall have their number of years of service for purposes of longevity calculated effective as of the first day of that school year. This memorandum of agreement represents the full and complete understandings of the parties regarding the matters described above. Is there a motion to approve the Memorandum of Understanding with Unit C regarding longevity? So moved. Uh, is there a second? Second by Member Alexander. Did you have a comment, Member Hollins? Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, as time goes on, there are a number of amendments to our basic contract, and they're identified with a heading. Uh, I've forgotten how it's done. Amendment A, Amendment B, Amendment C. This needs a title. And it should be whatever the classification system is for amendments. It should be added, appended to the contract. Our motion should include appending this to the contract with, I think they're done by an alphabetical amendment A. They're not, they may be called memoranda of understanding, but I think we're, there are already four or five attached to the unit C contract. There's one for ELT, there's one for, I don't know, other adjustments in language. So whatever it is, I think it should have a heading and be, and the motion should append it to the contract with the date. Yeah. Okay, so you're asking to amend the motion to include um, adding the appropriate appendix it's title. Appendix, right, appendix, and then it's Appen got appendix, a letter name. Appendix, title, or header. Okay. 
Um, and that's acceptable? All right. Okay. Um, I think, I guess we can vote on that amendment. Everyone approves? Yes. Um, so motion on the table to approve the memorandum of understanding um, with the addition of the appendix number and attaching to the unit C contract. Okay. Um, all those in favor? Okay. That is unanimous. Thank you, everyone. And then let's see. We will move on. We only have a couple more items. This is the stakeholder letter drafted by member Alexander. This is a draft. Um, and this is an extension. I'm sorry. This is um, following through with one of our governance goals, which was to draft an annual stakeholder letter. Um, member Alexander, did you want to speak to this at all before we jump in? Thank you. <coughs> okay, this uh, basically is a stakeholder letter and uh, the way I, this is like my second complete rewrite of this entire document. Uh, first one came out more like I'm giving a report to Congress, but this one is more talking to our neighbors and uh, fellow community members here in town and, and the format I was going with is Pretty much this will be our first of hopefully many letters to come in the future, but I took the time this time just to basically introduce ourselves and to promote uh, a few of the things that we are doing and to also promote some of the other things that's going on around the district. So um, the very last page is a paragraph that I cut out and it may be put back in, but um, that's uh, the last page, you can just disregard that last paragraph. It's just a, I didn't want to lose it, just in case we can use it. Um, the only other thing I was uh, working on was, uh, if you guys wanted to include a photo on this, a group photo, where we can, we're all together. But uh, if you want, I can read you the letter, but uh, it seems redundant. Thank you, Member Alexander. Um, is there a motion anyone would like to put forward? I would like to um, motion that we actually table any decision on this, but maybe take the time to each review it and make thought changes out. I feel like we have a lot on our plate and a lot coming up in the next month that we may want to address in some sort of a public document or like our opinion on how things are going before we make a decision. I, I'd second that. Okay, uh, motion to table by member Karen um, and second by member Hollins. Is there any deliberation? Yes, member Hollins? I just wanna say in addition to what Katie said, thinking about it, we, we have like stress around our budget which will be resolved soon yeah. And you've mentioned you want us to have some clear goals going into next year. We may have a new administrator to introduce. So it just seems like if we could just wait a little bit, we might get something that can allay fears and start the year with our goal or something. I don't know. But I think it would be useful just to wait a month maybe. Thank you. Member Karen? And just to complete, to also join in with Susan, that I feel like if we do this now, we're going to have some people who wish we had made some comments in a couple of months. I appreciate that. Thank you. It's, I, I think it's really well done, John. <laughs> Any Actually. other deliberation on that? Okay. Um, so we have a motion on the table to table the draft letter. Um, there wasn't a specified timeline, but it sounds like maybe a couple of months. Um, so we'll keep this draft as a foundation if the motion passes. Um, all those in favor of tabling? Okay, and all those against tabling? Remember Alexander? <laughs> okay. Sorry, Don. Um, so motion passes to table. We will revisit this. Remember Alexander, thank you very much for your... Um, your effort and um, yeah, yeah. I think it's a great foundation, and we'll use that as as our our, 
our main draft. So thank you. Um, let's see. We have one other agenda item on our formal agenda, and then we do have some new biz business to attend to. Um, this here, the last item, is school requests for maintenance and safe transportation. Um, I ended up with a kind of broader, this came to the table partially from health and safety recommendation to um, attend, to request that the DPW attend to some crosswalk painting um, and kind of prioritize that. However, uh, there are multiple projects that the schools would like the support of the DPW to attend to um, and prioritize, including some signage requests, um, some fencing requests, and some other items. So um, I also spoke with the superintendent about this, and it is not uh, generally a kind of common practice for the school committee to put forward a motion of this sort. Um, and I think that uh, it's worth acknowledging that we don't have to. However, um, I, she is meeting with the um, city engineer and she's aware of the requests of the school committee um, and some other items that uh, she will be requesting to prioritize. Um, and if we wanted to put forward a motion this evening, my recommendation would be to um, just support the work, the support the work of the DPW to prioritize and work on an accelerated schedule to address the needs of school safety and transportation, including signage and painting of crosswalks. Um, but again, such a motion is not necessary. If we want to put it forward, we can. I'll leave it up to you. Pardon? No, we're not saying thank you, DPW. We're saying, dear DPW, please prioritize some projects for the school. It came forward through the Health, Safety, and Facilities Subcommittee and a need to repaint crosswalks in and around the area of the Ferrante Avenue and Four Corners School. However, there are multiple projects that um, the schools have requested assistance and support for from the DPW including some signage for the playgrounds and school zones, um, as well as, I believe, some fencing items and painting of crosswalks that I think are beyond the location of the Four Corners School. Um, again, the superintendent has scheduled you know, a meeting with the town engineer and beyond, and there is a good working relationship with the DPW. Um, perhaps Member Karen can speak a little bit more closely to the issue that kind of brought this to the table. Um, so yeah, that the crosswalk painting was, we talked a bit about at our last um, Health, Safety, and Facilities Subcommittee meeting, because we were talking about how they are planning to repave the Four Corners parking lot, and that we are hopeful that that may help with the situation of parking and pickup over there. But in the meantime, we would really like to encourage walking to school and in doing so we need to have safe and clear walkways. Um, I am also, and also we have heard from many a principal saying they would like signs that say school zone, no trespassing during school hours, etc. cetera. Um, so it came for facilities and safety in that respect. I think that I personally, and I'm only one member of the committee, am okay with seeing how it goes, not putting necessarily a motion forward, that's not, since that is not common practice, um, and letting the superintendent really let them know that we are willing and able to help them in any way and ready to get some stuff prioritized that needs to be done. Member Hollins. I have a motion. Sure. With warm weather and an increased and 
increased encouragement of students walking and biking to school, to respectfully request our DPW repaint crosswalks for all schools, worn crosswalks for all schools. I'm sorry, I'll try it again. With warm weather and an increase and increased encouragement for students to walk and bike to school in May and June to request our DPW repaint worn crosswalks for all schools. Worn. Yeah. I was thinking of worn, like worn, like warning. <laughs> Is there a second? <laughs> Okay, I see no second. So the motion fails. I think that we got the overall sentiment out, though, that there is some um, support for. Did you? Okay. Support for um, the repainting of crosswalks and beyond. So I will follow up with the superintendent on this and get back to the committee and keep this as a live conversation item. It, se it seemed. My recollection is this wasn't a tangential. Uh, insignificant discussion. It, the discussion was about we really are encouraging more people to walk and in some schools the crosswalks you can't even see the paint anymore and that it isn't really time consuming. And the DPW probably has a schedule for repainting so it was to make a formal request that even if it's off schedule would they please since we're trying we have these traffic problems we're trying to encourage walking make sure the crosswalks are repainted now if they could. And I think there was a request that we even make a motion. Anyway, sorry. Thank you, Member Hollins. Um, so I do believe that we have some new business to attend to, and this is in response to the legal memo that we received via email related to the council's authority to um, change the school committee budget. Um, and this came to us just yesterday, um, and I did have a chance to speak with the superintendent because I personally felt that it was important for us to discuss this in new business, to consider putting forward a motion to the council in order to help guide the deliberation of the council on the budget as it pertains to us. Um, we, they will be voting on the budget at the end of this month, and so this is our sort of one scheduled time to put in a formal request um, for them to modify the amount of money that has been budgeted for the schools through the mayor's budget. Um, there was extensive conversation at the budget subcommittee level about spending our revolving funds. Um, there. Uh, Member Hollins went through some of that earlier today, and, and the conversation is reflected in the minutes. Um, however, we still have a significant budget gap between what the school committee put forward and voted in as our final budget and what um, we can make up or utilize to help close the gap through spending of our revolving funds. So um, I did speak with the superintendent, and of course, she supports the school committee budget um, for FY19. Um, however, it was difficult. I spoke with her and also um, a representative from TMS. It's difficult uh, to put forward any really specific number. Um, however, after the budget subcommittee deliberation, I think that we are closer to an understanding of what could be a good addition to our budget. Um, and I think that there are two options that the committee should consider. And one is um, affirming the school committee vote on our budget um, or putting forward a more specific request to council to help to balance our FY19 budget. Um, my recommendation would be to request the amount of no less than $400,000 
be added to the school district budget from the general fund. Um, and this is based on the number that I, that would put us in a range of level services. And I believe that in conjunction with responsibly spending some of our revolving funds, it will bring us to the desired school committee budget amount for FY19. Member Hollins. Well, I've thought a lot about this because I, I'm on the budget committee and my two colleagues on the committee aren't there, but we've gone through a tremendous amount of detail. I think it's fair to say that the mayor has expressed, uh, there's two things the mayor has expressed I'd like to mention. One, when he made his recommendation for his budget which left us with an 800,000 plus gap. He also wrote a letter saying, here's some things I'm thinking about and some things I want you to look at. And in fairness, we didn't have a lot of time on some of these topics. So I want to mention that he did make, here's some things I want you to look at. And I want you to know, we have looked at some of those items, which is how we found some money that we thought we could use. So I wanted to mention that. And I wanted to mention, um, how I've come to a number that I think we should recommend and why. I, I'm very close to what um, Adrian has mem mentioned. So we have um, thought about 426,000 to use differently from revolving funds. But my own opinion, not with the uh, a forum discussion with my subcommittee, I think that our budget left out two positions. This is just based on discussion that I think should have been in our budget. And for me, that's about $100,000. I think, again, we haven't had a firm discussion and a vote, but I haven't heard that we do not need that fifth grade teacher. I just don't know how we're gonna squish another 40 students into a class that doesn't exist. And. <clears throat> we've made commitments two or three times to the parents who were in the Math and Science Academy, which had a full-time principal, then it had an associate principal. And what came to our attention at our budget meeting is it looks like there isn't anyone in charge of it next year. And I think that's a big mistake with our commitments. So for me, I think we're, we're these two positions short. So that's $100,000. Um, there were also some discussion about items that we voted for capital improvement that were not supported in the capital improvement program. Sometimes capital improvement, you know, a $400,000 roof or another wing, you know, you're into hundreds of thousands of dollars. And sometimes what we want is something small that you could just pay for. And two of those items that I, I think we need, I don't think it's a, uh, I think these, it's important every year that if there's something we need for building security and it's not hundreds of thousand dollars and everyone is in agreement, we should do it. And one of those for me is fences. We have fences around uh, our elementary schools. And the reason we do is nobody's allowed on school property who's not working for the schools or doesn't come in the front door as a parent while our children are there. And we have some places where the fences need to be repaired. I, the, the estimate was around $25,000. It didn't get to capital. But I think we should just ask for the money because it's really important. And I don't think it should be either or. Either we're gonna fix a, fix a door that doesn't close or get, I just think we need to do it. And the other is something that's been around being discussed for a while, which is also about 25,000, which has to do with still using a system of keys in school locks. So everybody that comes to work or all the teachers, everybody gets a key to the school and anybody can go get it reproduced and hopefully it doesn't happen. And then it's not clear if you're returning keys, we're not changing the locks every time somebody resigns. So there's a newer, safer system for your home, for apartments and for schools, which is a non-key lock. We have this system at the high school so in other words, people get a badge, it unlocks the door, and when, if the person leaves or is, leaves the system, you deactivate their badge, and that's the end of it, and you can't copy it. 
So two things that we wanted in capital that weren't finance were fixing the fences so that we have gates and we don't have these open gaps and uh, making all the schools have the safety lock systems. That's two things for about 25000 So I figured that's 50000 we should ask for if there's funding. And then I think we need another 250000 um, minimum, if it's available, to at least have level services, which in our discussions, like what's the ultimate goal? Is it maybe we can't leap forward, but at least we shouldn't go backwards. We shouldn't start cutting things that we offer that students need, particularly in Greenfield, where you can't graduate without uh, two electives every year in your program. So we have to have money for our elective program. So for me, that's 250 to supplement our budget to close the gap, the $830,000 gap, and 100000 for positions that we took out when we made our budget, but I think are really needed, and 50000 to try and do the two security, you know, moderate security issues of fencing and key locks. So with those reasons, I came up with 400000 and I don't mind making a motion. I don't know where the money would come from. I was very intrigued with Mr. DeMarco saying, hey, there's 300000 over here for excess snow removal. Like, really? So, uh, um, I don't know where, I don't know enough about the budget to know, but if there is money, that would be my recommendation, and I'm happy to make a motion for that amount with my reason. So my motion is probably too wordy. I don't expect a second so that I have a perfect score tonight, but here goes. <laughs> with, <laughs> with time to study and review both the mayor's recommendations for the school district FY19 budget and also our own budget needs, I move to request the city council identify 400000 in the city budget for FY19 that can be added to the mayor's recommendation for the Greenfield Public School budget for FY19. Is there a second? Second. Second by member Karen. I broke your record tonight, man. Sure. It's wordy. Oh, I and I put, I put, I I put the wordy. preface because we have studied this and we really have gone through it line by line and with time to study and review both the mayor's recomm recommendation for the school district in FY19 and our budget needs, comma, I move to request the city council identify $400,000 in the proposed city budget for FY19 that can be added to the mayor's recommendation for the Greenfield Public School budget for FY19. Thank you. Is there any deliberation on this? Okay, there's a motion on the table. Um, all those in favor? Aye. That is unanimous. Not only did we second your motion, Thank you. Yes. How about that? <laughs> how about that? Um, I hope the minutes will reflect a little bit how I got there because I, I really think we need the funding for the fences and the keyed and the unkeyed entrances. And I, I really. I haven't heard anything yet to convince me we don't need the fifth grade teacher for a class of fifth graders coming up that don't appear to have a teacher. Thanks, Member Hollins. Um, and all there is continued deliberation on the budget. Just keep that in mind, everybody. Um, that will continue for quite some time, and it'll come. It'll, the budget will circle back around um, for us all to vote on again. Um, are there any new agenda requests? Yes, Member Hollins. Well, I went to this year's Pride with 40,000 people, and I saw that the Mohawk School District was there, and the Frontier School District was Franklin there. Tech was there too. Franklin Tech was there. Pioneer was there. I didn't see every single 
school that was there, but in prior years I've watched every single one. And I went afterwards to all the um, booths, to many of them there's fabulous resources. And this is from the uh, Massachusetts Department of Children and Families Supporting Children. It's called the LGBTQ Guide for Working with Children and Families. About a year ago, the Board of Elementary and Secondary Education, in conjunction with the State Commission on Education of LGBTQ Youth, uh, passed an advisory, it's about five pages of what school districts should be doing, including which policies should be updated and how you support a uh, gay-straight alliance in the high school, which we now have. But I'd like to recommend sometimes we put this on the agendas under maybe culture and that we have copies of this available in guidance offices and for principals because uh, both of those items, what the State Board of Education has requested we do, but this is really good. It explains gender terms, it, um, its resources for students, and there was a, a show on public radio the, just the other day from a, a group in Vermont, and, and it supports the research I've done that LGBTQ students in rural communities have uh, many more issues of support than in cities. And I think one of the statistics that was 46% of, of people who consider themselves transgender have committed, uh, tried suicide. It's a really pressing problem that we get up to date in our language and our understanding and have an inclusive school for staff and parents. So I'll pass it around, but I think we should have copies in the schools and have that on our agenda. And the other agenda item for me is I, I just want to say again, we need to have a time, even if it's a special meeting and even if only four of us can come and we can profile our terrific Federal Street Elementary School and their wonderful downtown programs and our terrific Newton School and the fabulous things that are happening there and maybe even the middle school, what they're doing, how they watch students, their achievement. We've had maybe three or three times on our agenda talking about traffic problems at Four Corners, where we have traffic problems really at every school. And we've had Four Corners give three presentations. And I love Four Corners, but we've got other terrific schools. And this is the time of year when parents are thinking about where they want to go to school. And I think it's just urgent we give equal time to our other schools. And I think I've said that before, but I do feel it's really important because they're all really great schools. Thank you, Member Hollins. Any other agenda requests? Okay, seeing none, um, is there a motion to adjourn? I better not make it. <laughs> 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 and is there a second? Second. Second by Member Karen. Okay, all those in favor of adjournment? <laughs> Don. That's unanimous. I think we're going home. Thank you, everyone. All of our productions at GCTV are sponsored in part by Bay State Health, providing the care you and your family need when you need it close to home. Visit them online at baystatehealth.org. Greenfield Savings Bank. Visit them at 400 Main Street in Greenfield. Call them at 774-3191 or go online to greenfieldsavings.com. Greenfield Community College, providing access and excellence in higher education in the Pioneer Valley. Visit them at gcc.mass.edu. The Hammond Family. The Hammond Family are longtime supporters of Greenfield Community Television. New Fortune Chinese Restaurant on the Mohawk Trail in Greenfield. Visit them online at newfortuneMA.com. Call them at 772-0838 and check them out on Facebook. Real Cleaning Services. Cleaning Hampshire and Franklin County since 1972. We don't cut corners, we clean them. Check them out online at realclean.com. Call them at 413-422-1143. People's United Bank. 
located at 45 Federal Street in Greenfield. You can call them at 774-3713 or visit them online at peoples.com. The Solar Store of Greenfield, replacing fossil fuels and nuclear power one home at a time. Visit them at 23 Fisk Ave. Call them at 413-772-3122 or visit them online at solarstoreofgreenfield.com. Thank you to our sponsors for supporting all of GCTV's productions.